Good morning and welcome to our special meeting of the Board of Trustees for the El Paso Community College Board of Trustees. Um, I'm going to open the meeting. Anyone that wants to join this meeting uh, via the uh, web, you can go to www.youtube.com slash user slash go EPCC. I want to welcome everyone and I want to call the meeting. Uh, Mr. Smith, could you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Pam, <coughs> please call the roll, please. Mr. Uxer is not here. Um, Mrs. Robles. Here. The microphone. All right, Mrs. Robles. Here. Ms. Sanchez. Here. Dr. Graham. Here. Mr. Haggerty. Here. Open forum. Nothing? Okay. All right. Uh, number five, uh, read 5.1, Pam. Item 5.1. Mr. Fernando Flores, Associate Vice President of Budget and Financial Services, and Mr. Rick Lobato, Executive Director of the Physical Plant, will make a presentation on capital improvement projects. Chair Haggerty and members of the board, if I may, uh, briefly before Mr. Flores gets started. First and foremost, want to thank you for your time this morning on a Saturday morning, as well as the staff, um, all of the cabinet members that are here. Um, it has been uh, too long since we've had a, a retreat with the board, obviously we had um, about three years of the pandemic that we were dealing with since March of 20. Um, we have met several times during that period of time really to ensure that the college continues to move forward and provide the level of instruction that the board expects and that our community expects as well as service to our students. Um, we have been able to do that and we felt that it was time given where we are that we pull the board together. Now, a couple of things, uh, Dr. Graham and I have exchanged emails and she's absolutely right. We, uh, we will most likely need to pull the board back together uh, once again as we go further into the spring term to look at additional planning. There was so much um, to really have a session of planning, you need all of the information. And so we are putting forward um, the information that the board needs to consider as we move forward um, into 2023 and beyond. So I say that with the, I give you the caveat that I fully expect that at the end of the day that the board will say we need more time to, to plan and I look forward to that. But there was so much since we had not met um, since 19 was the last time that the board came together for a retreat. So um, my apologies, there was so much information that we wanted to share with the board. In addition, there were times where we had to postpone uh, a, an item that's very, very important that we will discuss during executive session. Um, and so we wanted to put that on here as well. So um, my apologies for packing in so much, um, but it was all important and we wanted to make sure that the board had access to all of the information and all of the data as you move forward. So thank you, Chair Haggerty, members of the board. Mr. Flores, please. Good morning, Chair Haggerty, Dr. Serata, members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to provide you an update this morning for the next one and one half hours on capital projects. I'm presenting on behalf of Ms. Josette Shaughnessy, who is unable to be here today. I will provide you a brief introduction cover current and future funding strategy. Then I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Rick Lobato, Executive Director of Physical Plant, who will provide you a detail of the capital projects being considered. This update to the board this morning on capital projects will cover the current fiscal year and the next two fiscal years through August of 2025. This is essentially a multi-year capital project plan 
as recommended by GFOA best practice. The projects that are presented this morning have been identified by administration as being essential and necessary to maintain, renovate, and address some of the deferred maintenance issues in our facilities. During the pandemic, physical plant had the opportunity to do significant amount of work to address renovation and repairs throughout the district because the campuses were basically vacant. However, there is still a lot of work to be done. This is the agenda for the presentation today. I will be discussing funding of current and future capital projects. Then Mr. Lobato will address the next seven bullets on here, physical plant staffing, campus square footage, completed projects for the year just ended, 21-22. Then he will talk about currently in progress projects for 22-23. He will discuss master plan projects in progress. These are the facilities that were recently built, the six facilities. These are some open items to update the board. Then he will talk about unfunded projects for 22-23, potential future projects for fiscal years 23-24 and 24-25. Then I will close the presentation and discuss capital projects funding strategy from September of 22 through August of 25. Please feel free to ask any questions anytime during this presentation. Funding of current and future capital projects. When the board approves the $158 million budget for the current year, there's two line items that we're going to talk about that are part of the transfers budget that is presented. Annual budgeted transfers from unrestricted fund to plant funds include $900,000 every year to the unexpended plant fund. This is meant to address minor types of repair. Thank you that there's a transfer for $110,000 to renewals and replacement fund. And those are for types of uh, repairs such as carpet replacement, furniture replacement in open areas in the district, and then also parking lot repairs. I hate to interrupt, but I just want to make a note that Dr. Archer has joined the meeting. Go ahead. May, may I speak? There are two things. First of all, it's maybe Dr. Archer. Oh, I'm me. sorry. I'm, 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 I'm before he got his, he's being lazy. Okay, John. And, and, John Archer has met, joined me. And, and number two, I apologize for being late, but like any other student, I overslept. And, <laughs> and, and all, in all transparency, I didn't do my homework. Right? Uh, <laughs> time. We're glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Second item that we would talk about that provides funding for capital projects addresses probably the largest monetary source that goes towards capital projects, and that's the Project Reserve Fund. The Project Reserve Fund currently has a balance of $15.3 million. That's the amount that is rolled forward for the new fiscal year. So the Project Reserve Fund is replenished every year from budget surplus at the end of the year after there has been an allocation to fund balance. So the priority is to look at our fund balance with budget surpluses and then any remainder is considered to be transferred to the Project Reserve Fund. The next item. You, yes, sir. And real quick question. OK, we have the Project Reserve Fund. And, I, and I, I see that we want to replace that. But do we have any fixed policy as to what level we need to maintain it at? Or what policy? Do we have a policy say that we want to do this? Not only that, do we have a policy that says we, we will use uh, only so much, or how will we prioritize it? Do we have policies on the reserve fund, or do we do it as a 
as come as needed basis and a, and a feel good idea about level. We, we do not have a policy with regards to the to the um, project reserve fund, Mr. Exer. We we have goals that we have um, attempted to reach with regards to that. Depending on the budget year, um, there's times where it is very very tight. We do um, annually transfer uh, nine hundred thousand to the unexpended plant fund as well as 110,000 of renewals. So we do about a million dollars annually um, that we have committed to, but with regards to a specific policy, we do not have one. Um, this is also, um, as we went forward with the, with the master plan and we added new facilities, I heard clearly from the board and board members specifically that we needed to ensure that we were taking care of the facilities that we already had. Um, or why would the board allow to build new facilities? And so that's really what we're looking at with the project reserve fund is we're continuing to maintain, upgrade, renovate the current facilities that we have. Um, we've been fortunate over the last couple of years that our budget has been robust, primarily because of Federal Reserve, for, because of HERF resources that we've been able to allocate a significant amount of resources to the plant fund for it to have a budget of 15, uh, a current balance of 15.3 million. Mr. Flores, when was the last time that we had a current balance of 15.3? I, I can't recall, Dr. Never. Serata, but you're right on target. Um, referencing the HERF lost revenue funds, that is exactly uh, what has allowed us to um, do two things. Uh, Mr. Uxter, if I could add to that, when there are budget surpluses at the end of each year, the first priority is to look at our unrestricted fund balance. And it's practice to have about 15% of the operating budget designated for the uh, fund balance. So at the end of each year, Dr. Serata and Josette get together and talk about how much budget surplus there is. And then so I know that uh, Josette is very methodical about considering the the fund balance and the percentage it is of the operating budget. Um, since 2014, when we got hit with the Gasbys, uh, we we had a negative fund balance. We had a negative fund balance because we absorbed for the pension uh, about 23, 25 million dollars, and then a few years later we got hit with the OPEB unfunded liability. We got hit for $75 million that was transferred to our books, which drove our fund balance negative. Uh, our fund balance is no longer negative because of the attention it gets with these budget surplus. Um, so we do follow that methodology of looking at fund balance first, and then any remainder is considered for project reserve. The, the reason I ask is that one of the very, I mean, one of the primary, or the major responsibility of the board is the fiduciary responsibility of these funds, okay? And so all of this work that's done is really done our, under our, as a board, our approval, right? I mean, we, we get recommendations, you say you and, and Ms. Shaughnessy and Dr. Strada do that, but they don't make the final decision. It comes back to us, and although it may not be done specifically, we are actually authorizing through this, through our budgetary process. And so, so really doing all of this is something that we've all authorized, whether it's primarily noted or secondarily, but, it, but it's our responsibility to make sure that we, that this is all being done. If we don't have policies, it's still our approval. So we're on the hook one way or the other for, for all of this information, right? You're just letting us know what it is we've done. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So the project reserve, as I mentioned, is probably the largest source of funds for capital projects going forward. And later on, there'll be a slide at the end of the presentation that will talk about the funding for the next three years that will help um, elaborate a little bit more on how we look at the project reserve and how it has advanced and grown over the years. So the third bullet up here is another source of funds for capital projects are Transfers from the auxiliary fund every year on an annual basis, 75,000 comes from the auxiliary fund to the preventive maintenance fund for ongoing capital projects and 250,000 
uh, to, for parking lot renovations come from the auxiliary fund as well. And these are annual transfers that are done. In addition, uh, from savings from completed projects returned to the Project Reserve Fund, for example, if Mr. Lobato had a project of $200,000 and he only spent $175,000, first of all, we'd pat him on the back and then the excess would go to the Project Reserve Fund to be allocated later. So the last bullet is, uh, is just pointing out that project reserve funds stay project reserve funds for capital projects going forward. And that is another source of funding that is provided. Yes, sir. Paul, Jeff, back to back the same thing. So when we, when we allocate funds, in this case for that, I, what is it, a $50,000, uh, Dr. Sutter, you have $50,000 and under authority? 49999 Okay, so we, we've delegated, we've, we've <laughs> provided you that uh, authority. Yes, sir. Anything above that? Uh, and Mr. Lobato will come to us and say, here's what it is and here's what the project costs. And then I, I presume, I, I got thinking, but I don't know that I've ever seen a project closer presentation saying that you saved us so much money and that you, put, I, the only thing I hear is that maybe Mr. Flores will say, hey, Lobato gave us some money back. <laughs> but it, it is a rare occurrence, in particular in today's market that we, um, that we see a project come in under budget, um, just given just given the market and where the field is, that's accurate, uh, Mr. Uxer, and and we do. the The only caveat that I'd add to that is that the fifty thousand um, dollar board approval benchmark was uh, during the pandemic. The board provided authorization to me and the staff to move forward with what we needed to do. We would come back during the regular board meeting and update the board on any expenses or any expenditures that exceeded that respective amount. And I'll give an example. Um, when At the start of the pandemic, when we were looking at um, the need for tablets and uh, for iPads, tablets, uh, cameras, et cetera, um, there was a time where we expended over a million dollars, but we brought that to the board at the next board meeting, let the board know. The board did provide that authorization. That authorization did, um, the board chose to bring that back. Anything that is um, over $50,000, we bring to the board for approval. But again, you, you kept us informed. Yes, sir. And, Always. And everything uh, was kept. Okay. By the way, what happens to all those tablets? I mean, we bought them. Did we just give them away? No, sir. We, we ch the ones for students, we um, checked them out to students. The students were incredibly responsible and they came back and returned those. Uh, those that uh, we have issued to our respective staffs, they continued to, to staff and faculty, they continue to use them. The one item that we're looking at is hotspots. Um, Mr. F Mr. Fernandez has brought us up to speed. We have two contracts, one that is actually um, expires this month, if I'm not mistaken, and then one that expires in June. And we will most likely bring the number of hotspots down. We're not using them at the same extent. Mr. Fernandez is monitoring and seeing who used their hotspot over the last month, uh, six weeks, et cetera. And so those, uh, we will probably most likely let the uh, contract that is up in January expire, and then we'll continue to monitor that. Do, do I understand a hotspot's really a mobile uh, Wi-Fi connection? That's correct. Okay. Yes. I have a question. I've been here forever, I think, and uh, I still don't understand. In every budget for every uh, location, we have a dean, right? Is that budget for that campus include maintenance? All the maintenance is addressed through physical plant. Okay, so the dean has nothing to do with maintenance. They can't walk around the campus and say, uh, this needs to be painted, that needs to be fixed. They coordinate with Mr. Lobato uh -huh. on any repairs that are needed, and then they submit. Immediately? Well. I mean, I just had a, I, I, and that Dr. Srata knows that. It used to drive me crazy. I make a deposit at my bank downtown, and the railing on the Queen Anne building was falling in, and it took months. Now, I'm not a dean, and I'm just a guy passing by who pays taxes, and it just drove me nuts. But it wasn't fixed immediately. So I, what does immediately mean according to EPCC standards? So, so I'll jump in, Judge. So 
It, it depends on, on the need of the respect. If, if, if it is a danger, then it becomes an immediate action. Um, if it is something that is um, aesthetically um, unappealing, then we schedule it. And so you brought the Queen Anne to my attention. We made sure that that was a part of the plan. And uh, as we moved forward and completed the projects that we were working on with a com combination of things. So the labor shortage, that affected us as well because Mr. Lobato and his team don't necessarily um, fix everything themselves or renovate everything themselves. We do contracts with um, other agencies and other firms and that labor shortage affected us in the timeline. But as soon as it was brought to my attention, I brought it to our team's attention. We made sure that that got on the schedule. And as you can see, that has, is, oh, yeah, is either, fixed, yes, correct, but not as quick, not, it wasn't necessarily a, a, an emergency. It certainly was something that was brought to our attention and we made sure that we got to it. Well, here's what the problem with it was, is we were building a brand new, I don't know, what did we spend on that building? 39 million. 39 building, right next door. And here this other building was, and I'm going, well, this looks really great to the taxpayer. We're spending all this money on a brand new building, but we can't even take care of this building right next door. And I just wanted to know, what is the procedure? Do the deans walk the campuses and pick things out and, and Dr. Smith will weigh in and as with Mr. Flores. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing the issue up. Uh, so we asked the deans to walk the campus before each semester during faculty development and communicate any any issues to physical plant. And, and they have a great relationship with uh, Mr. Lovato and his team. One of the challenges that comes up periodically is some of the maintenance things can't be done while classes are in session. And so we often have to schedule things uh, intercession or during Christmas break or spring break, uh, et cetera. Um, but um, any, as Dr. Strada alluded to, any safety issues are addressed immediately. Uh, we had some issues at the Northwest campus uh, early in the fall semester where uh, even the r new roof had leaked and uh, destroyed some equipment. Uh, that was corrected immediately. And of course, uh, <coughs> some of the items uh, Mr. Lovato and his team have to work with, any kind of warranty uh, issues that we might have available on the buildings, other things we do in-house, other things we contract out, and depending on the amount of that contract out, we may need to bring it to the board. So some of those things do cause some delays in, in getting things addressed, uh, but I think by and large, the, the deans are kind of aware of what needs to happen on the campus as are other administrators that are on the campus. It's not always just the team uh, that is responsible for kind of monitoring uh, like student services at VB and, and some of the other buildings. I just, I just want to know that that gets taken care of. As, as a poor Aggie, maybe I can so. So we have this consultation, the deans and administrators, and here's something going on. But who says go and who says, who's the one that says go? Is that Mr. Lobato? I mean, after it's all said and done and look at the budget and look at who everybody thinks this and makes satisfied, and he talks to Dr. Serrata and he talks to you and he talks, but he's the one that says go or no go. It, it's probably more of a group conversation on priorities, um, but ultimately the budget has to be there and the people to do the work have to be there. And I think that uh, principally falls under uh, Mr. Lobato. So schedule. it's not really a group decision, it's Mr. Lo it's a group decision, but Mr. Lobato says go or no go. Mr. Lobato will consult with the uh, v yeah. VP of Finance for the funding for that? Yeah. And they'll look at the that, funding? That's back in the consultation part, but he's the one that says, okay, yes. he's cleared everything, go. Okay. Oh, good. So Just how much money? Is so how much money is in this maintenance fund? Just 75000 the 75,000 is the annual transfer. Yeah, annual, so what is the balance per se? Is it two million, three million? No. We that... received the budget, did you, did you go through it? Huh? We received the budget book this thick, did you go yeah, through it? Yeah, I'm not gonna go through I have man right here, I can ask him a question. I know, but we gotta move forward with the agenda. Well, I have a question, Mrs. Dr. Graham. I'm not allowed to ask questions. Yes, you are, sir. Thank you. How much money is in that account? <laughs> At the beginning of the year, we started with $56,642. Okay. And with the transfers that will come in, 
We have $211,642 in that. Thank you for that information. You're welcome. So anything for like painting something or fixing a wall or you got a kid go in the bathroom and punch the, punch the sheetrock. I don't think it's going to cost $200,000 no. to fix, but no. that needs to be fixed. Yes, sir. So that dean shouldn't have any problems calling him up and saying, go fix it. Plus, plus, there's money in the project reserve that has not been allocated to a budget for the year. Mm -hmm. So that's why Mr. Lobato, in consultation with Josette, Josette, I, Josette I will wanna, say. I, I just want to feel that the dean calls and says, I need something fixed. It's going to get fixed. Funding is not the issue. Huh? Funding is not the issue. I know funding isn't the issue. Right. It's the time. And it's just me because I. Fortunately for, I guess, whatever, I drive into that bank every month. Mm -hmm. Every month I keep seeing it not fixed. It just drives me nuts. So I wonder why, how it, what is immediate? Yes, sir. So thank you for your information. Absolutely. So if this, at this time, if there's no more questions on funding, then I'd like to transfer it over to Mr. Lobato. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Serrata, uh, Chair Haggerty, and members of the board for allowing me to present. Uh, I, can, I can address a lot of those questions we go through. And as, as you have que questions, please do interrupt and ask. And I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer them. At this time, I'd kind of like to give you an overview of the physical plant and what, what we are. We currently have 69 full-time positions. Of those, I have 12 vacancies. Oh, there it is. Um, prior, to, prior to this fiscal year, we used to have one assistant director, which was Mr. Torres. He resigned in, or I'm sorry, he retired in June of this year. Uh, our plan is to break that position up into two associate directors to concentrate uh, more on maintenance and operations and design and construction. Break that up, pull the responsibilities up, and hopefully by doing that, we can get a little bit more hands-on on there and become more efficient and provide better service for the college in general. The college, what do we consist of? Currently, uh, we have five campuses and one administrative services center. We total 2,176,917 building square feet that my department is responsible. Also, we have that's situated on 408.7 acres. When you break that up by campus, at Mission Del Paso, for example, a little boat over 164,000 building square feet, situated on 83 acres. I staff that with one campus tech and one grounds maintenance worker. I have an asterisk at the end of that because you know, that sounds like, God, that's not very many people. And while that's true, those people are there on a full-time basis. However, as I so showed you on the previous slide, where we really have about what I would call 52 hands-on people, uh, in order to maintain a campus or a district of this size, those people have to be cross-trained and be able to shift and provide service where we need them. So right there, you're looking at, to get back to one of your questions, sir, if we have a need at Mission Del Paso, the dean typically can, can, contacts the campus tech and says, hey, this, this floor needs to be replaced. What can you do? What he will do at that point is bring it to my attention or his, his supervisor's attention. It comes, it eventually, it comes to my attention, and I will discuss that with the dean. And if it's something minor, we take care of it immediately. We have an operational budget that's capable of doing that. If it becomes something that is probably more than $50,000, then I do have to go to my supervisor, Josette, and we have to figure out the scope of the work and the fund, break, work out the funding available. And at that time, we, well, have over 50,000, we have to bring it for board approval. So it takes a little time, but for projects over 50,000, yes, we will get them done. But the majority of these are minor and under that, and we take care of them as quickly as we can. 
Uh, Northwest campus consists of 103,000 square feet, 89 acres. Rio Grande campus, isn't that a beautiful picture of the Rio Grande campus? Took me a while to figure out that was the Rio Grande campus. Um, five mil, a little, almost 600,000 building square feet on 7.7 .7 acres. There we have two campus techs because it's an urban area. And urban areas have their own problems. Uh, we get a lot of transients going through. Uh, we get a lot of trash in that area. Uh, plus the fact that that campus is probably has some of the oldest buildings there, the Queen Anne building being one of them. Uh, Trans Mountain campus, almost 200,000 building square feet, situated on 94 acres and one campus tech, two grounds maintenance workers. Uh, Via Verde campus, one of our, well of course our largest campus, 746,000 square feet, situated on 112 acres and two campus techs, and we have 11 grounds maintenance workers here, but these are guys that provide service wherever we need them, when we need it. Uh, one thing I failed to mention at the beginning of this is of the uh, 5.2 million, I'm mean, sorry, 2.2 million square feet of these campuses, it doesn't include the early college campuses, which we still have a responsibility of maintaining the grounds on. Maintain That's all we have there. Yes, maintain sir. Maintain ground. You mean, uh, when you say maintain grounds, what's that cover? Just the, the dirt around the buildings, or does that include the building inside? No, uh, just exterior landscaping. Okay. We have to make sure the, the trees are trimmed, the grass is trimmed, uh, trash is picked up. No, the ISD is responsible for anything inside the door. ISD is responsible for the buildings themselves and anything in, in territory. The Administrative Service Center has 378,000 square feet, two, 23 acres, and two campus techs, actually one campus tech. Now we've transferred one over to Via Verde. I'm gonna get into some of the completed projects for the past fiscal year 21-22. Uh, I'm not gonna read each one of them. What I'll try and do is the highlights on some of the major ones. Uh, for instance, over here at uh, Service Road Repair Design, uh, no, Mission Del Paso had a problem with, we had a lot of flooding due to the water coming down from above, over the other side, eastern side of the freeway. This design was intended to take care of that. We have that project on hold. It'll, we'll, I'll come back to it on another slide, only because we're still waiting for the land transfer from the county of El Paso to take place. Uh, the road turn in off of New Waco Tanks Road. That was much needed, as, in my opinion, a safety item. We worked with the city of Socorro to accomplish that turn in, and <clears> it's really turned out nice for them. I don't, we don't have a problem there at all. And of course, the classroom furniture replacement, was that was the first campus we did that. That was completed as well. Uh, for the Rio Grande campus, uh, we did quite a bit of work at Rio Grande, and mainly safety related. When I say that, I'm talking about fire alarms were replaced in the A, B, and E buildings. Uh, we had roof refurbishments, Little Temple, A, bu a building, B building, and E building. Uh, replaced the chiller at the Student Services Center. Actually, that was not a planned replacement. It failed on us, and we had to get that done quickly. Uh, there's an exterior refurbishment of the Queen Anne building. Uh, this is an example of a project that we had a, I think we had a budget of 250,000, no, 242,000. No, the budget was 250,000, I apologize, and we came in slightly under. There were a few modifications there. We ended up redoing the landscaping while we were out there, uh, taking advantage of the fact that we were there to get everything, all the problems cleared up. We had to redo a gas line as well. Uh, why did that one take so long? It was identified probably a couple of years before that, sir, not only by the deans, but by my staff as well, and police department, who was actually housed there. But uh, a lot of it was, as, as said, aesthetic issues, where the campus had a lot of other safety issues that were there. So it, it got bumped a year before it got done. Um, my point is, though, it was just mostly that that wood would not have deteriorated if somebody would have went out a couple of years ago and put a couple of strokes of paint on it. Well, it deteriorates because there's no paint and it's wood 
And in a couple of years, with the, especially the sun in El Paso, what deteriorates unless it's painted? The issue with a lot of the exterior well, woods are, it was rotted and I'm it just, was. I'm just a little guy driving down the street. No, I understand. And it's just sometimes it becomes it was, a little more complicated. I noticed two years ago or a couple of years ago, it just upsets me a little bit. That's all. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Trans Mountain Campus, uh, we, we, the, we did the floor replacement at the bookstore. Uh, that was done because we used to get a lot of flooding at the Trans Mountain Campus. Uh, unfortunately, that campus, as I've mentioned several times, is located on the lowest part of the campus, so when it rains, everything floods down to the building. Uh, what we ended up attempting this year oops, was the flood prevention at the loading dock. We knew that was an issue, so what the what physical plant did was go ahead and look at the drainage area, redesign it, and we capture most of that water coming off the parking lot now, diverted around the buildings. And this was the first year Mission and Del Pat, I mean, Trans Mountain did not have any flooding at all occur, and we did experience some heavy rains. So it was successful. You'll also see there that we have the sewer line replacement. Uh, what, what we ended up doing is relining all the sewer lines at that campus. We're just finishing up right now. And that essentially gives us new interior sewer lines throughout the campus. The Vive out of the campus, uh, we did some rooftop AC units replacement. Uh, we, we completed the pavement design for the bus drop-off. The bus drop-off, which is located between the C and the B building, um, because those buses actually weigh a lot, it, it's deteriorated our pavement quite a bit. We've, we're redesigning that area so we can go ahead and put some concrete in there and clean that up. Uh, that project, the design was completed this year. We hope to do the project next year. Classroom furniture replacement was completed there as well. The IFC office remodels and fire lane improvements from the A and C buildings. That was another area that was repaved. It was an emergency access area. Uh, projects in progress for the fiscal year. These are some of the projects that we haven't quite finished, but will be finishing soon. Uh, this is the second phase of the wayfinding. Those of you who recall, we had the first phase, which was the marquee signs showing all the, uh, so we could highlight our campus and people could see them from the freeways. That's been completed. So now we're in the second phase, which is interior campus signage designed to get us or get students and personnel from the parking lots to the proper building. We continue with sewer line replacements as we needed. Cooling tower replacement, the ACB building is in progress and with some luck will be completed by March. That is a project that's been, that uh, supply chain issues have plagued us. Question? Uh, yes, sir. I apologize, go back to sewer line replacement. District-wide, what happened is it just we have aging pipe everywhere? We have aging campuses just in okay. and, and, and the reason I say that is that notice on the library you spent $77,000 for lining the pipe, okay? Now you're talking district-wide, that means 23000 for the rest of the camp. I don't know, I'm not sure. Let me, let me clarify that a little bit. That, that sewage line replacement district-wide was a project that was a, approved last fiscal year to move forward. Of that, we used 77000 for the Trans Mountain campus. Uh -huh. So we have a balance of about 30 to move into this fiscal year. I'm going to ask for another 100,000 to continue this work. Actually, it's 23, not 30. Yes, sir. Didn't you have a major problem here at this, at this facility? I'm sorry? Didn't you have a problem with rocks or something in the sewer line, or is that the water line? We had a few years back, uh, if you recall, there was a break uh, on the main water line up on Viscount. And when that, when the city water department went in, they broke the, they mistakenly broke the line further and allowed rocks into our system. So yeah, they had to clean that up, and we had quite a big problem getting those out for a while. It was right at the start of the pandemic. We had just shut down, and that occurred. 
But uh, to get back to your questions, Mr. Uxter, uh, a lot of our sewer lines have problems. Over the, the pandemic, or we were able to redo a lot of the sewer lines out at Via Verde campus. Is there a procedure to replace, dig up and replace a line, or are you going to line them? I presume that's a polyurethane what coat that goes around. In some cases, we have. pipe inside? In some cases, where we have a total collapse, we have to re re replace the line. Uh, at Trans Mountain, we're currently relining the pipe. Okay. It's much more efficient and quicker. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else do we have here. All right, Rio Grande, uh, this is another issue that we have. We'll be taking to the board, taking, going to the board for approval on the A building window replacement, Rio Grande. It's a static issue as well, sir. I don't know if you've noticed those win buildings. The, the windows are, have a wood frame. It's deteriorated as well. They're single pane windows. I want to remove them and come back in with dual pane, more efficient windows, and, and cl clear up the aesthetics. But that is another project that will be have to be taken in phases because we can't take the A building offline. We'll have to approach it classroom by classroom. So this 500,000 will take care of how many classrooms? Pardon, sir? This 500,000 you're going to be asking us in January. It's going to yes, sir. How many, how many uh, classrooms? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's over 30, sir. Okay. And uh, I'm being told right now that that will probably, that might not, that budget may not be adequate because of supply chain issues. Real quick question, do you specify the kind of, of frame? And I'm sorry? Say, do you specify the kind? The only reason I ask is that we replace windows in the house, and we got the real, the deal that the really good, long-lasting, whippy-dippy stuff was vinyl, and vinyl sucks. That is what we're looking at, sir, with uh, the high E factor as well. Okay. So uh, they become much more energy efficient. That'll help the building out, because these buildings are old, too, and the HVAC systems are, are struggling. That's a building that's probably in need of remodel, but that's, that's another chapter. Projects in progress continued. Uh, this is Trans Mountain. We're currently working on the gym shower, uh, locker room, ref gym and shower ref refurbishment, excuse me. Uh, cooling tower replacement, that's another one that should be completed in March. They're, they're waiting for the cooling tower to come in. Fire alarm replacement, that's a safety issue. Additional underground electrical cable, you might recall that during the pandemic, we almost completed everything. We found 2,000 square, 2,000 linear feet we did not. This will take care of that. For Via Verde, uh, we're in the progress of replacing the boilers and the cooling tower condenser pumps. That project will be completed this month. Both of them, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to mention the renovation of the four decorative fountains at Viaretta. Those fountains are beautiful, but they're also aged. So we have a project to, that we're working with the deans out there to bring them, modernize them. We've got a proposal coming in, and we're, we're anticipating we'll get that next week. We'll review it with the deans and see how they want to proceed from there. Don't let them take them away. Pardon? Don't let them take them away because... Oh, we don't plan to take them away, ma'am. Uh, the plan is to modernize them. Uh, they're gorgeous. That includes stocking them with goldfish? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Alligators. The master plan project's in progress. Most of the buildings have already been, most of the new buildings have been closed out, uh, including Mission Del Paso, which I have at the top there. But I did want to mention that that building has two chillers, or what I'm calling air-cooled condition, con air -cooled condensing units. One failed uh, quite a few months ago, and I've been waiting for them to come back and repair it. We've been, we were able to go through the summer without the need for it. But they are scheduled to come out this week, this coming week, and complete repairs on that. That was a warranty item. Uh, for the Via Verde AST building, uh, I'm anticipating closing that project out in the next couple of weeks. We have some issues where some of the lights, 
It's got, it's got a very advanced lighting control system, and we have about 11 classrooms where we can't shut the lights off. Uh, they worked on that over the Christmas break, and I believe we only have two outstanding now, and we, I will be meeting with these people next week to develop a plan to get those com completed as well. What do you mean you can't turn the lights off? The components that are on the lighting system are not allowing the lights to shut off. It's, it's not a simple light switch, sir. So, so in other words, are the lights on 24-7? Yeah, for, they were on for about quite a few classrooms, 11 classrooms. But now we only have two left with that problem, and I've got, I'm hoping the contractor can give me a solution to those two soon. But I won't close that project out until that is complete. Can we charge the extra uh, electricity charge for that back to some contractor for bad design? That would go have to go back to the uh, architect for the selection of the system. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately. The, the, the city has a new code which requires these type of systems. And sometimes, well, oh, friends, Marco, technology is great, but too much is too much. I would have preferred simple light switches. <laughs> okay, um, getting to J building. This is probably, this is a troubling one. Those of you who are aware, the elevators there, we have three elevators. Uh, over the summer, we had quite a bit of problem with non-reliability. They were, they were shutting down on us. We came to find out that the reason they're shutting down is the controls are located in the header of the top floor of each elevator and they were overheating. So we had, I had to push that back to both Park Hill, the designer, and Arrow, the contractor, to come up with a solution. They have come up with a solution. They were their plan is to ventilate each shaft. They have ordered the equipment to do so, and they'll be installing them this month and into next month. However, my concern is, while, the, while they are telling me they're 98% sure that will solve the problem, I don't want to release all the funding until we've gone through one summer. So I've worked with Mr. Gardo and our attorney, and we're, we're, try, we're trying to figure a way to retain some of that money without and still close the project. But I don't want to leave the college in the still be under warranty after the summer, right? Pardon? Would those be still under warranty after the summer? Uh, they'll still be under warranty, but however, if they're not working right, the warranty will end soon. And I want to make sure this project is done. What do the warranty get? We have one year warranty. And that project, uh, I believe, will be out of warranty in March. Well, that won't make, that won't make summer. That's why I want to hold the money back and make sure if we hold the money back, they'll fix them. Yeah, well, I guarantee you, you pay them, they're out of here. Yeah, we'll never see them. This brings us to this fiscal year, what, uh, what we hope to accomplish. These projects have not, have not been uh, funded as yet, but we're bringing them to your attention because we believe that they truly do need to be done. I've, what I've done is broken them down by campus, by priority, by campus. So uh, I will go through each one of these at one time. The North Loop Drop Inlet Replacement. That is a drainage area leading from our campus over to the, over to the North Loop Road. And the heavy traffic and the buses have broken down this drainage system to the point where it's not safe for the vehicles to pass. What I've done is put a uh, steel plate across them so that can <coughs> occur. However, the design is complete. We hope to get this project done with your all's approval uh, during spring break. Ice chillers, we have two ice chillers that are over 30 years old. These ice chillers, I call them ice chillers because we use them at night to build up ice that we use. We melt the ice during the day to provide cooling to the campus and that gives us a lot of energy savings because it keeps us off peak for the electric company. But they're 30 years old and they're, they're in need of replacement, so we're doing the design for them and the cooling towers this year. With I'll come back next year and ask for the funding to replace them. 
The next uh, few issues at Vibrant that we're all familiar with, it's the elevator issues that we've been having. Uh, I want to go ahead and make sure we modernize the elevators, the A, B, and C building. What is modernization? It's replacing all the mechanical and electrical components off these 30-year-old elevators with new, new components that are much easier to get hold of. Also down there we have the new elevator design and installations for the A, B, and C buildings. That estimated, if we go through with it, would be at 3.5 million. Tom, what, they're all by, you're going to modernize and then new, are these separate, I mean separate elevators? You're not yeah. modernizing something you're going to replace the new, I mean I don't understand. No, we're not going to replace these, sir. They would stay here. They're all separate elevators. But the plan is, and I'll, I'll have a slide, I'll explain that a little better in a little, little bit. But the plan is to go ahead and design additional elevator installations okay. for the A, B, and C buildings. So that's additional? Right? Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Uh, for the gym, we want to go ahead and re-roof the gym, the C building, and the ATC-1. Trans Mountain, I have some components of the ice storage system that I need to replace. Uh, also, the roof drain repairs. We did re-roof Trans Mountain a few, I want to say two years ago, but now we found that the roof drains, which run interior of the building, are cracked on top, and when, it, when they get full, they're flooding into the building, so I want to get those repaired as well. Uh, and last but not least, uh, air handling unit replacement there. Uh, I've selected four of the worst ones to get replaced. Uh, this is continued for Rio Grande. Uh, cooling tower replacement, we're going to do the design for the cooling tower replacement for the H and B buildings. Uh, start the classroom furniture replacement. This will be the last campus. We'll have completed that after this year. Mission Del Paso for the shooting range, we need to replace the boiler and the exhaust system and do a controls upgrade for the entire campus. Northwest, we have the C building roof replacement, library roof repair, and resealing of all the windows. Northwest has a lot of glass and we're starting to get some rain infiltration, so we want to reseal all of those windows. Uh, land ASC over here, we also have the roof repairs for this building. And there is that additional 100,000 I'm looking for district-wide sewer line repair slash replacement. That's a, that brings a total for this year that we're, requ that we're requesting at $8 million. Mr. Lobato. <clears throat> yes, sir. To close out just this section, how many projects are pending uh, or proposed? Hundred? I mean, I'm just, I didn't count, but there's. Okay, okay, and you're responsible for all of that. Following we, that, is this is this why now we're going back to two associate directors, so that we can have a, what a closer. I mean, it, that's a whole lot for you to keep in that little head of yours. I mean, it is, sir, that, and that is to, the reason we do want to reorganize and break. Have two associate directors responsible for that. Okay, so they can follow it closer. Yes, sir. You mean as an Aggie, you can do that. I'm hoping with that, with, 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 I'm thinking that with those positions added, we're going to do a much better job than we currently are. Golly. Okay, second question. All of this stuff is a lot of maintenance. What, I, I would guess all of it, 90% of it is covered by code? Yes, sir. What's your working relationship with, with uh, I guess it's the city of El Paso? We have an excellent relationship. Okay, with so you don't. So everything works, and and you know we had we had some coding issues, some getting some code when didn't want the construction. I mean we had delay and everything else, but but that's that was peculiar to that code working with the code and staying online and all that is not has not been a, is not a, a systemic problem or anything like that. Never been a problem with us, sir. Okay. We we have had some issues with. The fire department, I mean, not really call them pro pro problem, problems, but we, where uh, we weren't made aware of some of the some of the decisions or th thoughts they were moving towards. But once we meet with them and we sit down and have a clarification, we're fine. Okay. Right here is what I. When we started having problems with the elevators, out at the C building, uh, we the camp. Well, Josette and I sat down, and thought we better make develop a plan on how we would look at this. So that's what you're looking at here. 
what I basically broke it down into is three phases. The first phase, which of course was repair of the C building elevator, that was completed uh, in December of this year. This past year, I'm sorry, it's hard to say that already. What you're looking at is a chart there. Everything in blue is for 2022, green 2023, and the burnt orange would be takes out for 2024. I looked at phase two, which is the modernization of all three elevators, the elevators in all three buildings. Um, we, we'll be taking an uh, item to the board on, well, I, I apologize. If we get the requested projects approved, we'll start moving forward with these in January and hopefully complete them by 2024 of December. That'll be the B building. The reason the B building stretches out so far is because it's a single point failure. I can't take that elevator offline or else the people don't have access to the second floor. So I have to wait till winter break to do that. The other two are not and we can move forward with them. Why do they stretch out so far? Once again, once I give the, the okay to the company to come start ordering parts, it's gonna take them that long to get them. The last phase would be the addition, uh, additional, addition of the installation of the additional elevators. What we're, what we're thinking about is of course we wanna make sure that these shafts are exterior shafts. They're gonna be built on the exterior part of the building. The rationale on that is we can't shut these buildings down during construction, so we have to put them. And while we're doing them, the thought is to put in a second elevator and then a, actually in a third elevator, which would be a service elevator. So when people take furniture and other equipment up and down, they're not using the personnel issue, elevator. That's part of the problem we have right now. When these people come in and want to do that, they the tendency is to hold the doors open while they load. The problem with that is personnel ele elevators lock out after 45 seconds of holding those doors open. So we have a lot of issues with that. We're putting signs up to try and alleviate that, but it is a problem. If we go ahead with, uh, with the elevator installations, we probably anticipate being done with that entire project. If we go, should we choose to go with all three, would be in September of 2024. Now you're going to do how many elevators? Pardon? How many exterior elevators? That would be three exterior elevators for three buildings. A total okay. of actually well, a total of six. Uh, two elevators for each. Two additional elevators: a service elevator and a personnel. Oh, okay, elevator. okay. For each building. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Hmm. These are. This is where we kind of get into guessing what we're going to be into 2023-24. Uh, these are other projects that we come up with, but the fact is, are they, are they needed? Yes, but they can wait another year before we can get to them. Uh, we've got the ice chiller cooling tower replacement. That's the, from the design prior to that. Uh, student service center cooling tower replacement. Bus drop-off repavement. That's another project that comes in from a design we're currently working on. ATC is in need of roof repair or replacement. Uh, building A at the Viverell there as well. Moving to Northwest Campus, we've got the M building roof replacement. Rio Grande, we're going to start looking at the boiler replacement and cooling tower replacement there. Trans Mountain, uh, re replacing the evaporative cooler with a refrigerated air conditioning system. Uh, main building, we're going to start replacing air handling units there. We'll pick four at a time until that's completed. In the next year, we'll see another four come in and then we'll be done. Trans Mountain, uh, we've got the underground chilled water pipe replacement. We've got some chilled water pipe running underground there that is about 30 to 40 feet deep uh, and we anticipate, we think there's a leak there, we just have not been able to locate it. So we plan is to abandon that, move it overhead and that way we can do a better job of maintaining it. Mission Del Paso, the EMT refrigerated air, that's also a system that has uh, evaporative cooling at the time. ASCA, uh, rooftop air conditioning replacement, these are units here, are, have reached their service life and it's time to start looking at them. And controls upgrade as well. And roof repair at the B building. You'll see down at the bottom we have two other projects listed. I just want to list those, bring them to your attention. 
for the ASCA building here, we have about 20,000 square feet of undeveloped area. Um, we're working with the various departments in this building to try and decide what they may need for space in the future and how we might build that out. What you're looking at is a cost of 4.5 million if we just took it on and rebuilt it all up. But that project is still being developed and we'll, we'll be discussing it more in the future. Dr. Serrata? Yes, sir. So remodeled to use additional space here. I mean, do we need additional space? Is this administrative activity? Are we moving stuff from campuses? Why? So what we've done over the course of a number of years, Mr. Uxer, is we've <laughs> relocated non-direct student um, facing offices to the ASC. Um, these, uh, I have pushed the, um, the ASC remodel, re remodeling and I've pushed that. I, I really want the work to focus on direct student and campuses. Um, but over time, we have been able to, uh, to remodel a significant number of space here and relocate individuals that are not student faculty, pardon me, staff that are not um, student facing or student direct contact. So this is sort of an ongoing concept. It is. It has been ongoing for a significant period of time. Okay. And Mr. Botto, if I look at this, unfunded projects for year 22, 23, con, you know, continued as eight mil, and then potential fee project is like nine mil without the model. So we're looking 17 plus or minus uh, over the next couple of years. Yes, sir. And I, I understand some is scheduled, some is needed, some is wish list or hope, not not wish, but hope hoped list or something like that. But we're looking in roughly 17 million dollars give or take a million uh, over the next two years. Yes, sir, and there's a third slide coming up for 24-25. I don't we, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, but th th these projects are projects. Some of these will slip into the following year. It, it's, yeah. It's because i be quite honest, we probably will not complete every project that we ask for this year. But this so gives a chance to prioritize this stuff, and here's, here's the list. What it does, it gives me a plan so I can plan for the future, look ahead what we need to do. And without this, I, you know, without this, you don't want to be guessing year to year. So we developed this. Actually, two years ago, we started looking at this. And it, I'm glad we're finally being able to bring it to your attention. So you can see that we're looking to the future where we can. And we, we, we're doing our best at that. Do you have this in Excel spreadsheet? Uh, this, no, we do not have it on Excel spreadsheet. Well, that, that, I do. I do have it on my own, but we... No, it's not published, but you, you, you scheduled out sort of. Yeah, okay. and as projects get complete, completed, they go off, or as projects get move on to the next fiscal year, I move them on that. Okay, so it's kind of a living document that I use. Okay, and that was one of the assets of being able to go to New Mexico State and learn how to do all this. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I said, this is one of the assets, This is, is, you had learned at New Mexico State and how to schedule this and do this in an orderly, responsible fashion. Uh, you know what, we that. did some of that in New Mexico State. Uh, <laughs> actually, okay, you do, okay, okay. <laughs> you learned this uh, through years of experience. Fantastic school up there. Uh, last down there, we have the Mission Del Paso Student Union. Uh, we, we're going to be meeting with the student government and Dean Villalobos out there. They do want another student union out there. We need to select a spot, decide, decide how large it's going to be, and see if they can afford it. But we're moving forward with that as well. Ah, here we go, 24, 25, another six million. It does drop a little bit as the years go on because, but believe me, there will be other emergencies that'll drop in there, the unplanned. My crystal ball is foggy. But at Viverda, at that time, we'll be looking at the runoff retention pond improvements. The city of El Paso approached us a few years back and asked us to start looking into our retention ponds at Viverda because they believed that we we're contributing to the flooding on North Loop. Uh, we did look at that some, and throughout the, throughout the years as we've done construction, we, we've modified this and we've made improvements. But what this 1.5 million would do would allow us to put a drainage system in. So hope, hopefully, as what we, similar to what we did at Trans Mountain, 
we'd stop flooding some of these buildings because in the past we did have a habit of building all our buildings in the lowest part of the campus. Okay, uh, landscape improvements at Fire Tech and Baseball. Uh, removal of the well pump and tank from the parking lot out in front of the gym. Years back, we used to use a uh, irrigation well to water all our grounds. Unfortunately, it become very, it has a high alkaline content. It started killing most of our plants. So we had to stop using that well and it's just been abandoned. So the thought is to get it out of there and remove an eyesore and get a few parking, lot, parking spaces. Uh, building M, boiler replacement. Northwest Campus, Rio Grande, we've got uh, some hallway tile floor replacement, parking lot J repave, repavement, and at Trans Mountain, uh, the parking lot and access road at Whispering Springs Road is probably in, in, going to be in need of some attention by then. Also the ice chiller replacement and boiler replacement, HVAC controls, and another for air handling units. And at that time, I hope to look at the ASCB building rooftop unit replacement. That really, I believe that wraps up what I've got. I, if there aren't any further questions, I'll turn this back over to Mr. Flores, and he can tell you how we're going to pay for all that. I do have a question, sir, uh, Mr. Yes, Novato, because I know I like the plan that you have for your uh, uh, staffing. But my question is, have you worked with HR on the salaries? Um, because I know that a very qualified person applied and you and I had that conversation and you know he would have been perfect but the salary was way below what they are currently making. I am working with HR all the time to see what we can do about the salaries. But One, uh, just a real quick suggestion. Water is a precious resource out here, and you're saying that we have a pump that, that's high alkaline. One of the attributes of El Paso is this tremendous new development of the RO system that they use out at Fort Bliss and everything else. And, and I, I was just wondering, is this a chance for us to do some sort of cooperate with somebody uh, either at U here or at UTEP or a coordination? Uh, a research project maybe to install something so that we can continue to use water that you know that, that that's a so good thought look, and I can look into that so look at, and that could be a sponsored project a, a, a grant something and see my it we just can't shut off water we, you know if we can figure out some way to use it and get maybe get a grant to cover some of the costs or something like that well yeah. it's something I think I can look into sir Any, any further questions? Bernie? Thank you. Thank you. So you've seen the multi-year capital projects plan presented by Mr. Labato. so I guess the next question is how do we pay for that? Well, this is the planning part of how do we pay for that. So as I recall that at the beginning of the presentation I mentioned that there was 15 point $3 million in the project reserve beginning the new fiscal year. So, and you can see in this roll forward that we have here for three years in front of you, uh, it starts with 15.3 million, and then in the red immediately below that are the projects that Mr. Lobato presented, the 8,050,000 that he outlined for you in detail of unfunded projects for 2223. And then so at the end of the current fiscal year, we estimate that conservatively we will to transfer $8 million over to the project reserve. And why do we do that? We, we do that because as Dr. Serata pointed out, in the current, current operating budget of $158 million, we have 11.1 .1 of federal reserve recovery estimated for this year. So that $11.1 .1 million is available for one-time projects during the year so largely that will go unused, we're estimating. So that will be available as budget surplus. So after we consider what will be needed for the fund balance, we estimate conservatively that eight million will be able to roll in at the end of this year. Incidentally, last year we transferred eight million. We actually did a transfer. 
And last year we had the HERF revenue funding for lost revenue as well. So we have it this year as well. So we're estimating conservatively to roll in $8 million at the end of this fiscal year. So as you advance the $15.3 million less the planned 22-23 projects and then add the estimated transfer, for the beginning of next year, 23-24, we'll begin with $15.2 million. So as Mr. Lobato detailed for you potential future projects for 23-24, they had a value of $9.1 million. You can see that in red up there. And then next year, we estimate $3 million to be transferred in. And we estimate $3 million because we will no longer have the HERF federal lost revenue recovery for next year. But still, the $3 million is conservative because over the last five years, over the last five years, we've transferred in $31 million. That's an average of $6.2 million over the last five years. So the $3 million compared to $6.2 million that we've done on average is still a conservative number. So when the 15.2 gets adjust, adjusted by the 9.1 of uses and then the $3 million rolling in, you roll forward a beginning balance for the beginning of 24, 25, $9.1 million rolling forward. Yes, sir. You have a, but a spreadsheet that's forward looking on the whole community college budget system, uh, a three year or five year outlook, you know, understanding that it's an estimate as you go forward, right? Do your whole budget? We, we, have, not, we have not updated that worksheet because the parameters that we operate under have changed so much over the years but uh, we, we have not updated that, that, uh, that five year model that we had developed uh -huh. several years back. So you're not utilizing that anymore? No, sir. Hmm. This would have been nice to be able to plug these numbers into it. Yes, sir. So as you begin 24-25 on this roll forward, the projects identified by Mr. Lobato for 24-25 have a value of $6.1 million. So at the end of 24-25, without even considering a transfer in, we're still to the good by $3 million rolling forward. So this is our look at how those projects would be funded going forward. Are there any questions? So please consider that the projects presented by Mr. Lobato for 22-23, some have not begun to be worked on. So we would like to proceed with those projects. Also, we would say that we have aging campuses. Uh, Rio Grande, Valle Verde, and Trans Mountain are all over 43 years old. In addition, Northwest and Mission del Paso are over 24 years old. What we would bring to your attention is that the projects that Mr. Lobato has presented do not cover renovating those campuses. So um, this concludes the presentation today. Uh, Mr. Lobato and I would like to thank you for your time and attention. And do you have any other questions? If not, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Um, Very good information. We, I, I just remind the board, we, the projects that we listed as well as the funding that um, allowed us to move forward, this was a once, from my perspective, a once in a career, um, once in a lifetime, uh, investment from the federal government through the um, HERF resources that has put us in a position that we're able to move forward with these. The three million is much more uh, that you saw as an estimated um, a 
amount that would be transferred into the plant reserve fund in 24 is much more of the normal um, amount that we would transfer. We were able to transfer significantly more resources because of the lost revenue that we received through the federal government. Um, this will put us in a position where we'll be able to get to and fund significant number of projects where we're ensuring the maintenance of the current facilities that we have. Um, but over a period of time, that those resources will, will cease. And so we'll continue to brief the board and let you know where we are on these respective projects as well as what we anticipate as the need of the district. But this was something that we felt very strongly with regards to as we were fortunate to receive these resources from the federal government. And that's my point. Uh, what's those you see? Did we put all this new square footage on board? 47 years goes by fast. We have to look at putting money away now so they have it 47 years down the road. It's like Dr. Graham likes to accuse me of always ruining everything here before she got here. We need to plan for the board's future because these buildings are going to, they need to be kept up to date. They either increase tuition or set up a pot of gold somewhere, but stuff goes on and it doesn't go away. That's why we need these discussions. <laughs> All right. You want to go straight to the next one? Yeah, straight to the next one. Okay, we're back from break. Uh, Pam, could you read 5.2 and 5.3? Yes, sir. Item 5.2 and 5.3, Dr. Julie Pinley, Vice President of Research and Accreditation and Planning, will make a presentation regarding an update on the status of the SAC COC reaccreditation. And item 5.3, Dr. Pinley will make a presentation on the status of the College District Strategic Plan. Guess let's just get right into it. Um, I these are each um, high impact uh, items. Uh, I believe the the board and cabinet are, are familiar with where we are with SAC COC, but it never hurts to to give a current update on that. And then I wanted to uh, introduce the results of the first year of area planning, speaking to the strategic plan. Okay. So, um, the first update, SAC COC, a quick summary of the process. Uh, about a year ago, February of 22, we submitted our compliance certification as part of our decennial reaffirmation. That, um, that certification addressed, uh, it says on here, 72 principles, but many of the principles that SAC COC asks institutions to speak to uh, have multiple layers, multiple parts. Um, and so really that number is probably closer to about 89 or 90. Uh, that review uh, by our peer uh, institutions took place last spring. Uh, we received the result of that offsite review in April of 22, which uh, found uh, noncompliance in 24 of those principles. And so, Last summer, uh, Cabinet and I worked diligently to address each of those principles that the reviewers found us to be out of compliance with. Uh, during that time, also, we were preparing for the logistics of the on-site visit. Many of you as, as trustees were involved in that visit. Uh, many Cabinet members were also invited to uh, speak with the on-site reviewers about those 24 principles. Uh, the result of that September visit uh, led us to still having one principle that um, we were judged to be non-compliant with. And we also had a bonus principle that we thought we were cleared on earlier, but the on-site visitors uh, asked for some more information. So from those 89 or 90 principles, we still have two items that we are still working on 
to respond to? None were core requirements. None of them Thank were core you, requirements. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Serata. And uh, although it was, uh, I'm, I'll be perfectly blunt, it was a bit of a sucker punch when I saw the um, offsite review report, um, we, we are actually in very good shape. Uh, we are in one of the best positions that we've been in in uh, the recent uh, two or three reaffirmations. Uh, excuse, excuse me, Dr. Will yes. you detail what those two are? I'm sorry? Will you detail further yes. on this, what those two are? Oh, okay, great. Yes, absolutely. Um, so right now, uh, I'm working with uh, Dr. Smith and with uh, Dr. Amaya and VP Shaughnessy on those two pending items. The response report is due to SAC COC uh, around spring break, so we, we have some time. Those two principles that we uh, are still being found out of compliance with involve faculty qualifications, specifically three faculty out of the um, 900, I, I'm not sure exactly how many full and part-time faculty we currently have on the books, but three faculty. Um, talking to my colleagues around the region, talking with um, folks that have been through reaffirmation before at the college, Dr. Smith, Dr. Serata, uh, th this is not surprising, given that they are, uh, the SAC COC reviewers go in depth into every faculty's um, transcripts, uh, work experience, certifications, just as they do with administrative staff. So. Of those three faculty, two are in um, the biology discipline and one is in the math discipline. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, has worked tirelessly uh, and we've, we believe that that response is ready to go. Uh, we, we're just uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's on that one. And it, Dr. Bentley, how many faculty did they review? They initially reviewed 95 faculty. Uh, well, they, they, at the on, at the on site, they reviewed all of our faculty. 1,269. Yes, and of those 1,269, the off-site <clears throat> reviewers had questions about 95 faculty credentials. 95 faculty's credentials. And so over the summer, uh, Dr. Smith and the deans and I worked to uh, see if we could provide additional information on those 95 faculty to see if, if uh, SAC COC peer reviewers could find their way to um, agree with our determination of, of qualifications. Uh, we, we were close. Uh, the on-site reviewers in September spent a lot of time with Dr. Smith uh, and with those credential folders, pouring over those, uh, there, there were those three that are still uh, in the works. Would those character, those that are still pending, would you characterize <clears throat> the discrepancy or the, the difference in interpretation or was there just an overlook? Uh, a, a, uh, overlooked a requirement or was it a misinterpretation of a requirement <coughs> or a difference in evaluation of ability you know of the quality of the certification how would you characterize it um, that's a that's a terrific question uh, my personal if I were the reviewer of, of these faculty I would say uh, in one case the faculty probably did not have those qualifications and we should not have credential them. That was my own judgment. I, I am not uh, involved in that process anymore at the institution. Uh, in one case, it was an oversight on our part. We failed to provide uh, some critical information that would have um, reiterated the individual's qualifications. That has since been addressed. We, we have that additional documentation. Uh, in the third case, um, it, it frankly could have gone either way. We could have doubled down and made the case that this faculty does have all of the required uh, hours. Um, we thought it would be uh, more prudent to concur with the on-site reviewers. Just curious, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the second uh, principle <coughs> has to do with student complaints. And this one is, um, is a bit of a tapestry because there are many ways at EPCC that a student can express concerns or file complaints, uh, whether it's something that happened in the classroom, 
whether it's something that happened uh, involving an employee, uh, a behavioral situation with another student. And that's why uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Amaya and VP Shaughnessy are all involved in helping uh, craft this response. Um, as with the faculty qualifications, I believe that that response is ready to go. Uh, we're, we're just uh, taking one more pass at it, double checking that everything is aligned with our policies and procedures and with the narrative that we are submitting to SAC COC. I do want to reiterate that um, regardless of what had happened in, during the off-site review uh, and with our intense focus report over the summer, the timelines are the same. If we had sailed through our off-site with no recommendations, with no findings of non-compliance, this timeline would still be what it is. Um, it is a lengthy process. Uh, the EPCC uh, orientation of leadership, Dr. Serata and members of cabinet, uh, that happened in December of 2020. So, so this part of the reaffirmation um, has been going on for quite some time. Uh, SAC COC Board of Trustees will vote on our uh, reaffirmation of accreditation this summer. And we uh, fully expect to maintain our accreditation. We have been accredited all along. Uh, the work that we have been doing over the summer and, and continuing through today does not change the fact that we are still accredited by SAC COC. We expect that accreditation to, to be uh, renewed this summer. Dr. Saad? Yes, sir. At this point, you say we're still accredited. But there has been some concern, at least by some of the other uh, community colleges, as to whether they would continue the participation. I heard that one of the other community colleges continue with participation in SACs. Is SAC still the gold standard? Yes. So for the state of Texas, um, SAC COC, for all of the public institutions in the state of Texas, they continue to be accredited by, by SAC COC. Uh, there has been, um, in December at the annual conference, um, there was a colleague who came up to give me a heads up that he and his institution were considering um, leaving SAC COC and looking at um, another accrediting body. Uh, I do think that with Florida and litigation, not, not litigation rather, but the, um, the governor passing, uh, the legislature and then the governor signing on a, a passed law, where all of Florida now, all institutions in the state of Florida, and Florida is one of the 11 states that's part of SAC COC, um, they now have to leave, uh, they have to choose a new accrediting body um, within the next five years, each of those respective institutions. That, that opened up um, the window the, of, of possibility that other states may look at different in, accrediting bodies. <clears throat> Dr. Whelan, who's the president and CEO for SAC COC, has kept uh, abreast of, of those concerns. Um, and so you're absolutely correct. Dallas College is, is looking at the possibility of switching accrediting bodies. If just as a theory, hypothetical, if we were to leave or any Texas CC to, were to leave, does it affect the standing other than just your acknowledging? Uh, I mean, this is totally an independent one-on-one -on -one with us and SACs or us and anybody. That, that's correct. There, there is no uh, mandate that we have to be um, accredited by SAC COC. There used to be until the federal government changed those respective um, rules and our regulations where institutions can now leave their respective regional uh, accrediting bodies. Um, so that, there is that possibility. Um, it is a long and arduous process to, to be accredited as we have seen and as the institution historically has dealt with accreditation issues over um, each respective accrediting uh, cycle. So SACS prides itself as being the most stringent of all the accrediting bodies. And, and there's some flexibility concerns. Um, in particular, as we're gonna continue and as we go through the day and we move forward um, with respect to the Community College Finance Commission, 
There are some concerns, uh, and Justin Lenon, the chancellor of, of Dallas Colleges, um, that was what he expressed to me. He gave me a heads up. He said, you know, we're looking and we've let Dr. Whelan know that we may be looking at a new accrediting body just based on the flexibility of what they want to do and what they want to be able to provide and offer to their respective community. Just w one last. Yes, sir. F very far out there, look forward looking, but the concept that <clears throat> free community college for everybody funded at the federal level, does that also bring in the concept that federal, then you would have one federal accrediting agency? And so is that the, would you envision that as, as a forward path if somebody were to even look at that? And then that, and that's a word. Or do we even want to talk about that? I'll ask Dr. Penley to weigh in as, as our SAC COC expert, our accrediting body expert. I personally um, don't see free community college as moving forward. Um, it was considered at the federal level. Obviously, the votes were not there. The Biden administration left that off their list of priorities. Um, I think that individual states and, and, and within individual states, community colleges are moving forward with a version of, um, of a promise program. Uh, with regards to a national accrediting body, uh, I'll let Dr. Pentley refer to that. So um, there, there is an overarching uh, accrediting agency um, that each of the seven accrediting bodies, middle states, um, higher learning Com commission, SAC COC, in turn respond to, and also to the US Department of Education. But there's, uh, I have seen no conversations about a one size fits all accrediting body. And just and one last thing, yes, as sir. far as funding, I mean, if you consider what what we have and and uh, Pell Grant and stuff like that, functionally we have a, a high percentage of free community college here in El Paso anyway. That that is correct. You know, if you look at all of the aid that our students um, qualify to receive, essentially that is accurate. You have a significant percentage of our students that pay no out of pocket expense for tuition and fees. Uh, to attend the institution, but you referenced something as well, Mr. Uxer, that is key. Accrediting bodies are incredibly important because they determine the, qu the quality of the institution, which in turn allows the institution to receive federal Pell Grants. Without accreditation, we would be ineligible for Title IV Pell, which a significant number of our students qualify for. And also for our employees to pursue and receive federal grants. So we had talked about the possibility yeah. of maybe grants for, for some of these um, facilities projects. Uh, and we, we've got several uh, grants from NSF, uh, US Department of Ed. So, and, and frankly, uh, I, poor Dr. Serrata, I, I tell him this all the time. The, these are really best practices, and these are things that we should be looking at and internalizing regardless of, of having to respond to a report. So if we are doing right by our students and by our employees, accreditation takes care of itself. Um, so this, this is uh, a quick overview of where we are. We are in the red arrow right now. We are uh, ready to submit our response report uh, in March. And then we are just waiting for the SAC COC Board of Trustees uh, vote on our uh, re-accreditation um, later this year. So with that, are there any questions about uh, accreditation in general or where we are in that reaffirmation process? I have a question. Excuse me, Jack. Go ahead. Um, I just have a question on, I know that you're pretty close to wrapping this up and you took the lead on it. Thank you for that. You did a great job. Um, do we have like a process in place to give it continuity so that <coughs> I know for the next accreditation that someone has been following some of these uh, requirements, um, you know, so that we can have them constantly being looked at and, and have them in place mm -hmm. uh, before the next cycle. So we do, we actually have uh, an internal um, 
check and balance, if you will, and we also have one from SAC COC. Because 10 years is a long time, uh, they require us to submit a five-year interim report. So it, it's not as though, uh, unfortunately, I can go back to my office for nine years and say, oh, I'm done. Uh, we're, we're constantly keeping up, uh, getting ready for that fifth year report in uh, 2028. Um, internally, I have established uh, a calendar and have uh, communicated with uh, cabinet and with other offices on uh, when things should be done on their end. And then in my division, constantly collecting and, and updating our files so that we have that information uh, at the ready. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Did they find any problems with the board leaders? None at all. Oh, I see. They want to we, visit with you one more time, Judge. We did. <laughs> you were absent that day, and so he never he, we up. had some things at the offsite that that we needed to clarify. We needed to provide some additional information on, uh, but at the onsite, um, no no issues. Okay. Great. All right. You got a check mark for that one. You, you got a green check mark. Yes, from SAC COC and from me. <laughs> Um, so, and so, any other questions about SAC COC accreditation, all that good stuff? <coughs> okay. One of the related items uh, that we do have to respond to with accreditation uh, is a strategic plan, and this is where your role as the board with setting a mission and a vision uh, feeds in. I know you've seen this information several times. I do have uh, the hard copies of the strategic plan if anybody would like another copy for reference as we go along. Um, so this update summarizes where we are in our current five-year plan. Um, from the mission and vision that you all established, we as a college have identified four overarching goals. Uh, and not surprisingly, given our role as a community college, uh, providing quality education, driving student success, foster engagement and partnerships, and sustainability. Um, this is a quick overview of the annual area planning. Uh, every um, budget head submits uh, area plans. Uh, we follow an academic year with our planning cycle, so in September, the Institutional Planning Office uh, begins receiving area plans from each budget head. Uh, we do not tell individuals what to create their plans. Obviously, as the experts of their work, they establish their own area plan. Um, once the plan itself is established and identified, then we uh, receive monthly progress reports uh, from October through July. And then the planning year ends in August with a final assessment of the year's efforts. Would you define exactly what area means? Um, a department, typically. Uh, so within my division, I have an area plan. What, do, what does the VP of RAP want to accomplish during the year? I also have six directors. So what does the Office of Institutional Effectiveness want to achieve? What does the uh, Institutional Research Department want to achieve? So it's typically uh, analogous to a department. Okay. It could be um, uh, a collaboration, like new student orientation. That office may uh, work with um, the QEP office or with uh, financial aid office to create a, a collaborative plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah, when you define it like that, so how does the Office of Institutional Planning, who puts all this together, make sure they've covered everybody? Uh, they have, uh, they use a software package and they also have uh, internal spreadsheets that they, they monitor who has submitted a plan. Um, uh, individuals will tell you that if they don't submit a plan, the planning office will reach out to them to so say. So the planning office is responsible looking at EPCC as an entity and say, hey, we've covered everybody. Uh, in, including, yes, uh, and this, these are staff offices. So faculty, like the English faculty, don't submit area plans. They're, 
their uh, progress of their work is monitored through a student learning outcome process. This is only for administrative support and student support areas, oh, not yeah. for faculty. Who puts faculty and yours together? Who, who looks at EPCC? Is that Dr. Serrata looks at the whole thing and says, hey, I've covered everybody? So, the, so this planning includes uh, staff and administrators, and then faculty are with student learning outcomes and our general education assessment, and then my division. Uh, okay, we, so we you're responsible to make sure that everybody's been touched. Okay. That we don't let anybody fall through the cracks. Okay. And then the, the next planning cycle year starts in September again. So it, it's an ongoing process. It happens every year. We're currently in uh, year two of the five-year plan, just as a teaser for what's about to come. A little bit more detail about each area plan. Uh, so a budget head, as they're creating their own plan for their area, department, offices work for the year, uh, we require that that plan speaks to one of those four strategic plan goals that I showed you. Right? Uh, otherwise, it's a to-do list, right? Um, with, so after they've identified uh, which strategic plan goal they will be focus on, focusing in on for the year, we ask them to dig a little deeper, and uh, many of these goals have multiple intended outcomes. And so... Figure out your overarching goal, and then within the goal, which of those specific outcomes will your plan seek to uh, move the needle on for the year? And then, uh, because it's best practice and because it's good to see the fruits of your labor, uh, we do ask uh, the individual submitting the plan to provide evidence uh, you know, kind of a trust but verify approach. Here's what I want to do over the year. Here are my monthly progress reports. Here's what I accomplished at the end of the year. And here's my evidence to show it. And we use that internally to help the department move forward. We also use it for external reporting to the coordinating board, to SAC COC, to grants. Um, so it's just a way to document everything that's happening at the college. And again, I want to reiterate that these plans um, are self-selected by, by the individual leading the department or, or uh, the leaders if it's a collaborative project. Um, and the individual writing the plan also self-selects which strategic plan goal and which intended outcome. The Institutional Planning Office certainly provides training and offers input, but it is a judgment call on the department to decide where their work fits in terms of supporting the strategic plan. All right. Dr. So, Strata, yes, sir. Don't you have a say so in agreeing that they have selected the appropriate area to focus on? You or somebody at, at this at your level? So, no. so each of the respective plans do go up through the the uh, chain of command, if you will, and. Um, they know their respective departments best, and so they, um, with their respective vice president, they will um, review those. Um, I, I generally do not change anyone's plans. And I, there may be suggestions. I work with the cabinet members, and the cabinet members um, will go through their respective plans, and, and we can make suggestions. Okay, but at some level, you make yes. sure that it works all together. Yes, sir. Okay. In other words, you're not micromanaging the directors. <laughs> not at all. You sure? <laughs> Don't you have time for that? So th this uh, is the overview of last year's plans. Again, this is year one of our five-year plan. Uh, we had 103 unique uh, area plans submitted last year, 255 uh, strategic plan outcomes. So obviously the math does not work out. What that tells us is that area plans often identified multiple outcomes. And I, I can give you an example of that as we go along. Of those area plans, uh, the most 
frequently targeted outcomes had to do with optimizing support services and ensuring quality and effectiveness. Really <coughs> not a surprise as a community college. Th those should be uh, front and center for many of us. Uh, another uh, strategic plan outcome that was commonly tapped in the area plan had to do with increasing student retention and graduation rates. So again, no, no surprise there. On the other end of the spectrum, um, strategic plan outcomes that were not frequently uh, highlighted in area plans uh, are the three that you see on this slide. Uh, maintaining physical strength and accountability, promoting co-curricular learning, and prioritizing individual campus and workforce safety. And the numbers above each of those uh, boxes represents the total number of plans that spoke to that outcome. And there's a reason why I'm showing you all these numbers, uh, which we'll get to in just a second. Dr. Pelion, uh, the area plans and you know some of the common areas in that, uh -huh. we, we do have the increased student retention and graduation rates. Do we have anything on increasing um, recruitment? By the way, I do like the new commercial, Dr. Mo, that was, you know, at least we mentioned that we are the most affordable in, in, that, in that one commercial that I saw. So we, we don't have recruitment as a specific um, outcome verbatim, but we have uh, promoting a college-going culture. Um, facilitating college transitions, and that's where the recruiting efforts will play in. And in both of those cases, we had uh, over a dozen unique plans that spoke to those. So we can still maintain the pressure on Dr. Amaya. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so digging a little bit more deeply into the results of the year one plans, I'm going to break these down by the four goals. Um, and again, this is all self-reported. When an individual creates their plan, they're choosing their plan. They're choosing which area of the strategic plan they're focusing on. They're also uh, indicating whether they believe the plan has met its goal or not. So no judgment on my on my division's part. Um, the first goal, providing quality education to meet students' diverse needs. There are five outcomes listed at the bottom of the table. Uh, and you can see the percentage of plans that indicate that they met their desired outcome. In parentheses at the bottom of the slide where it, it identifies the five outcomes, those are the specific number of plans. So facilitating college transitions, which may include recruitment. It may include um, career transfer services, getting ready to go to a four-year institution. Uh, it may include the dual credit program in early college. We had 18 plans targeting that outcome, nine of those 18 reported as being met at the end of the year. So that's what those numbers represent in parentheses. So when you say facilitate college transit, that's facilitate transition to college as opposed to intra-college. So that's, that's the trick. And um, we want to, uh, much, much like SAC COC <laughs> with the principles of accreditation, we want to give people enough information to give them a sense of the work but not so much that we're painting them into a box. So we are not defining this because different departments work and you know, we may have people at the front end with new student orientation. We may have people uh, in career transfer services that are helping students trans transition to the next phase of college for them. Um, so we're not saying what each of these outcomes uh, encompasses because we have so many different departments at the college that have different functions, which is a blessing back, and a curse, to be so honest. So that comes back to Dr. Graham's question. If, if we're really concerned about getting people in the door to start with, mm -hmm. it's really a subset of this one. Mm -hmm. And so there should, be a, there should be a way to track because if we don't get them here, the rest of this sort of is meaningless. Exactly, and we, we can, we, we know each of those 103 plans and we know exactly what, what they said that they were working on. So we could, 
we can see exactly how many are working on recruitment, how many are working with transfer students, how many are working with um, post-graduation next steps. So in other words, buried down in, buried in, into that can answer Dr. Graham's question, mm -hmm. how are we doing about getting people here mm -hmm. from high school ISDs? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have that data in other formats uh, in, in my area, in Dr. Amaya's area. Um, very quickly, um, it's in the annual fact book. We can see how many students from each high school and each ISD we, we've, um, supported in coming to the college so just um, as a just a personal observation it seems to me if we don't have a student there's no reason to be here so it seems to me that that i would elevate that to that as a goal and outcome separate and identifiable <coughs> in and of itself but then Absolutely. you know so again I'm this not is going to micromanage this is year one of the strategic plan data, and as we get, uh, we, we're not at the point where we're rolling up our sleeves and uh, drafting our next strategic plan, but these are, these are um, seeds that we're planting in Cabinet's mind, in the board's mind for, okay, here, here's what employees are doing. Are we on the right track? Do we need uh, to recalibrate? Do we need to shift our focus in our next strategic plan? And just for clarification, that's one of the reasons that we um, requested from Dr. Serrata that the board be given reports on a regular monthly basis so that we can look at this in more detail. Because transitions, like in this example, mm -hmm. can be from high, the ISDs to EPCC, EPCC mm -hmm. to UTEP or other universities, mm -hmm. or the workforce to EPCC or people that are at home trying to get into uh, EPCC. So it transitions covers, I, I was just uh, earlier discussing with uh, Dr. Smith that, you know, the military have interest in, in transitioning the students when they, Absolutely. either the ones that come as spouses and, and wanna get into college, as well as the ones that are coming in and then we don't really, um, have the ability to just place them in the early college high schools as soon as they arrive because they are coming throughout the year. Right. Uh, and sometimes our early colleges are already, um, you know, uh, have the number of students that they can serve. So those are great uh, reports that we can get during the year at our regular board meetings because then they can detail this. Uh, I'm interested on 1.4 on this particular one that provide the state of the art infrastructure, mm -hmm. technology and services, seven out of 14, do we know? Like, are the other seven uh, something that's gonna need additional funding or mm -hmm. is it because we haven't quite finished the infrastructure that, you know, that uh, supports that technology? So some of these, uh, on Dr. Graham, they're in process right now or in progress. So they, they're already, um, we're working on them and some of them are also, we're gonna be bring, bringing in from, at, the, at least the ones that we submitted from IT, we're, we're gonna be bringing some for board approval for funding. So we're working on the other seven? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Right, so actually, um, Dr. Graham, you read my mind. Two points that I wanted to make. Um, the, these are district-wide plans, and, and as Mr. Fernandez said, some of these are in IT, some of these uh, are in uh, other divisions. Um, and relatedly, again, these only include staff and administrative areas. So faculty, of course, are doing a lot of things with preparing students for marketable skills, promoting co-curricular learning. It's just that they're not embedded uh, and captured within the strategic planning process. They're captured in the student learning outcome process. Which we also have to empower faculty with the knowledge because... Right. And the our director, moving. our director of student learning outcomes, is is doing a bang up job um, with her training, with her outreach, facilitation, empowering faculty uh, to to um, re envision the learning outcome process. For those of us that are not real familiar with the phrase, our director, use her name if you're going to compliment them. <laughs> it, it, I absolutely want to compliment her. It's Ms. Rebecca Bell. Okay. Um, the, the second point I wanted to make that we've, we've sort of danced around here is 
Uh, again, these are self-reported as being met or not met. A couple reasons why a plan would not be met. Uh, the biggest is that it's a multi-year plan. And, and again, Mr. Fernandez alluded to that. Um, State-of-the-art infrastructure, technology, and services, we can't snap our fingers and make that happen overnight. It does take a couple years in some cases. Um, uh, marketable skills, it could uh, involve documenting with, with multiple agencies and, and aligning with what the uh, Coordinating Board and, and Texas Workforce Commission are, are looking at. So, so the fact that it's not met doesn't mean we've crumpled it up and thrown it away. It could be an ongoing effort that may take a few years to, uh, to see the positive results. We may never get there because the technology keeps shifting. We learn something and then the next month we gotta come up with a new uh, equipment or new training. That's correct, it's always evolving, so that's a great point. And one other thing that I also wanna bring up is that uh, I've, I've been meeting with every uh, cabinet officer to prioritize those projects that are outside of IT that obviously are related to technology that need IT support. Uh, so I'm been working with all the cabinet officer members to uh, prioritize those projects so that we can more efficiently uh, have them completed in time. Mm -hmm. So the second goal in the strategic plan is the one that most, the most frequently tapped uh, for the area plans, 94. Um, outcomes out of the 255 spoke to student success in one form or fashion. Uh, and just like the previous slide in the next two slides, uh, you've got the specific outcomes outlined at the bottom of the slide. You've got the number of plans that uh, attempted to move the needle on each of those and the number that uh, are identifying uh, as being met during last year. Um, goal three, foster engagement and partnerships. This is another um, goal that is intentionally vague uh, in order to have each department interpret for themselves what that means. Um, the engagement could be internal in terms of staff development, uh, recruiting qualified employees. It could be external in terms of community partnerships. Um, we are not defining that for each department. They're doing that themselves. Can I go back to the drive student success on uh, of course goals 2.4 and, and 2.5? Uh -huh. um, Dr. Serrata, at the ISDs we're seeing, um, you know, quite a, a huge challenge with academic outcomes of uh, students post the pandemic. Yeah, learning loss. Yes. So. It, you know, it's going to be really critical that, that those two, 2.4 and 2.5 on goal number two, um, you know, and be really focused on to, to anticipate that the population that we're going to be receiving here at the college is probably going to come in with more academic deficiencies and learning losses than before. Um, so, do we need to have like a, um, a group that just focuses on that to make sure that we uh, maximize the resources that we have in the college to make sure that we do everything we can to close those equity gaps and, and provide the support services? I, um, many years ago, I don't know, Dr. Smith, if you remember when we set up those uh, meth emporiums that work so efficiently for quite a while. I don't know if we still have that, but that concept to me was really interesting and important because we were not holding back students that just needed a little bit more support versus the ones that came in with a huge uh, gap or deficiency. But I'm, I'm thinking that maybe we might wanna consider that not just in the math area, but in the other areas that we're going to be seeing the, the learning loss. Yeah, uh, and Dr. M, um, really important point. Uh, the math emporiums, for the record, are still operational uh, and doing great work. Um, we continue to evolve those support services. Um, one of the things that the board has seen 
several times over the years is a huge grant investment in first year experience <clears throat> for students. Uh, recognizing that that first uh, semester or two is incredibly important. And uh, through uh, y'all's vision and Dr. Strada's vision, we begin to institutionalize those grant efforts because we're seeing great <coughs> success in uh, students uh, going through those programs. So we've got dedicated first year advisors for those students, et cetera. And that's all under the director of uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, who's in the audience here. So uh, I think it would behoove us to, you know, maybe work with some of the ISD folks and see what they're seeing from their end and make sure that we're able to address any of those issues as well. Uh, the state also uh, acknowledges that and looks at uh, the need for developmental ed coursework. We're seeing an increase in students coming in and needing developmental coursework as well. So uh, we've increased our capacity in those areas. Um, one of the really fun things that we're seeing is uh, we've got co-requisites now for developmental courses and college level courses. So rather than stick a student in a developmental class, make them go through that for 16 weeks and then try a college level course, we enroll them in both uh, at the same time and we're seeing uh, pretty good success there as well. well that's great. Now, I, I, I just worry about that, you know, that, that um, that we can't get ahead of the, of the game on that. Thank you. No, Dr. Ram, we, we share the concern. And um, at, the, at the onset of the pandemic in, in the spring of 2020, Commissioner Keller um, allowed us to go into co-requisite models. There was a lot of uh, innovation that occurred from the state level that allowed us to continue to move forward and ensure. Uh, the issue, obviously, in 2020 and 2021 was, was the lack of participation and students not participating. But I certainly share your concern with regards to learning loss and ensuring that we're able to get these students up to speed. The co-requisite model, as Dr. Smith indicated, will be a key, uh, a key piece of us getting students into credit programs um, and facilitating the success of them in those respective credit programs as quickly as possible. Uh, that is, is gonna to continue to be a concern, not just from you. Um, local philanthropy has been focused on this for a significant period of time, Creed, um, and obviously our region, at least from my meetings with the superintendents and our meetings at the collaborative, um, we have closed the gap quicker than other regions of the state. Um, we anticipate that uh, at least dealing with the superintendents, they believe that they could um, get students back up to speed within a three-year time frame, as opposed to even Commissioner Marath uh, thought that it would take five to seven years to, to close that gap. And I, I do see um, TA is putting out quite a few announcements for grant funds that are tied into LEAs. So maybe we should focus on those funds as well. Uh, so we had briefly um, introduced the foster engagements and partnership uh, goal of the strategic plan. Again, five uh, specific outcomes within that overarching goal. And uh, of those, uh, a little bit over half overall uh, identify as being met. I like that 3.3. There you go. And then finally, goal for uh, sustainability. Um, this was the overarching goal that was um, least commonly selected. Uh, that, that was most of the plans focused on other goals. So this one we, we may uh, need to revisit uh, for its uh, practicality or its usefulness within the strategic plan. Um, the five, goal, uh, five outcomes, and you can see how uh, the planners reported as being met or not met. Again, uh, many of these plans are multi-year plans, and so um, I would caution about reading into uh, specific percentages as being uh, too high or too low. Um, so the, these are works in progress. A little bit more information um, because, um, again, each uh, cabinet officer uh, obviously has a different focus in his or her division. 
uh, I wanted to just present a quick overview of some of the most commonly uh, targeted pieces of the strategic plan that each of us are focusing on. At the vice presidential level, in, in our four divisions, these are the areas that uh, we are each addressing. And, and not that these are the only areas, but these are the ones that come up again and again in the master list of how many plans there are, how many plans are targeting a specific outcome. Um, and a lot of it is, is uh, intuitive, at least from my perspective. Um, uh, obviously, Dr. Smith's area should be focusing on uh, engaging students, increasing retention and graduation, uh, Ms. Shaughnessy, uh, including uh, ensuring quality and effectiveness, uh, my own area also including uh, ensuring quality and effectiveness. I do have a few that are more uh, direct student contact. Um, that's because my division includes uh, student learning outcomes as well as the quality enhancement plan. And so we do have some direct student work uh, happening out of my division. And then uh, Dr. Amaya, of course, uh, increasing EPCC visibility and facilitating college transitions among the most commonly selected plans. Within the AVP divisions, uh, here are the plans that are most commonly selected. Uh, there are uh, other plans that are included in their wheelhouse, but these are the ones that pop up again and again. Uh, as before, many of these are intuitive. Uh, Mr. Primozic's area, of course, would be aligning partnerships with regional educational, economic, and workforce needs. That, that should be uh, obvious. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, as he spoke to providing state-of-the-art infrastructure. Uh, Dr. Mo, of course, increasing EPCC visibility through our marketing efforts. So the take-home message from year one of our five-year strategic plan is uh, about 46% of area plans last year, uh, the user or the owner of the plan indicated that that plan was met. The other 53% uh, are either ongoing plans or it was an effort that was not successful and uh, the budget head is regrouping to figure out how uh, to move forward with that work. And uh, I plan on uh, providing these kind of updates for the next few years to, again, give you a sense as we gear up for the 2026-2031 uh, strategic plan, uh, how we can each use our role in the process uh, based on this data. So again, we're not ready to roll up our sleeves just yet and start <coughs> drafting the next strategic plan, but the quick overview of how that plan evolves is you as the board uh, our governing body, of course, direct us through generating the mission statement and the vision statement for the college. From there, uh, Dr. Serata and cabinet with college-wide input from uh, faculty, staff, and students um, finalizes the strategic plan, uh, how we will accomplish the goals that you all, uh, as the board, have outlined in the mission and vision statements. And then the strategic plan in turn drives these annual area plans. So that was the purpose of this presentation is to give you an update of where we are. Um, the second purpose uh, Dr. Graham uh, alluded to is what information we as cabinet or Dr. Serata as the CEO can provide you to help guide your work. Um, and I know that that's a, a big question, um, if you all want to convey those thoughts to Dr. Serata, what you would like to see in the monthly data presentations or information presentations. It doesn't necessarily have to be this heavy numerically, uh, but what information we can provide you to help guide you in your work, uh, which in turn guides us in our work. And I with you that- you managed to capture the strategic goals and articulate them because I know when we talked about them, we had a lot more verbiage in there, but you concise them really good. So, okay. um, you know, and, and I think we're go headed in the right direction with that. Um, I think the way that we end up communicating what presentations we want is, is kind of being shared directly with Dr. Serrata, and then he arranges for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
because we all have different interests. I know I'm more interested than anything on our student-related outcomes and, you know, and where we're going with that, but I think that we could just continue working with just letting him know. Um, yes. And if there's not a request for a report, then that's when we can plug in some of the progress that we've made on some of the areas as the cabinet's choice. We want to make the best use of your time. We don't want to waste time with information that you don't find helpful. So, thank you. Right. Any other questions or information I can provide at this time? I do have a question. So you had mentioned that on the self-reporting, so there, the individuals are self-reporting that. So is there a mechanism to check that, or how are they, how is that verified? Um, ab about what the plan speaks to, or whether they, whether it's met or not met, or right. the whole right. process. Yeah, the whole process. Yeah. Um, so we, we really, um, uh, Christy Frescas in our, um, the Director of Institutional Planning, she really wants to avoid micromanaging another department and saying, you know, your plan stinks or your plan is not the right plan. Um, because the, every department, they are the experts in their work. Uh, but she will guide them and say, you know, your, your plan is, is good. You say that you are going to uh, try to move the needle on every one of the strategic plan goals. Do you feel that that's realistic in one year? Or can you tell me a little bit more about how this plan uh, will move the needle on X? Um, and sometimes those conversations sort of solidify in the planner's mind, oh, no, I, I don't have to, I'm, I'm not personally responsible for every one of those strategic plan outcomes. Okay. The other thing that has really helped us is emphasizing the need to document the work, not as a gotcha, but as a way to help the user understand, here's what my work looks like in a typical year, and here's where my piece of the puzzle fits into the college plan. And uh, the result of that, quite frankly, is that we're, we're seeing fewer plans, but they're better plans. And they more directly speak to the strategic plan. I, I think in the past we've had um, kind of an abstract relationship with the plan is much beyond cabinet or maybe higher level um, administrators. Uh, it, it didn't really resonate with many employees, and so now spending time saying, here's what your work is, you, you do great work, and here's how you support the overall work of the college. And, and that has helped answer that question that you have about how are we determining what the goal should be or whether the plan is met or, or not met. We're still leaving it up to the individual creating the plan, but we're giving them more resources and more support to guide them. Len, I apologize, can you go back and refresh my memory, the relationship between the strategic plan and SACS? So one of the, um, SACS UC has many uh, principles uh, under the general heading of institutional effectiveness, and, and having a strategic plan and having uh, documented evidence of working towards um, supporting the mission of the institution. That, that the mission isn't just lip service, that we're doing something to speak to that. So it, it does relate very strongly. And the, the relationship, the communication, does it include the area plans and, and mm -hmm. the uh, prog self-reported progress? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and those were things that we, we spent some time providing additional evidence of this summer is, um, in addition to being able to tell SACS, you'll see, yes, we have a strategic plan that supports the mission statement. Oh, okay, so what? So here's how we monitor that, and here's how we engage every uh, administrative area and every student support area in uh, planning and in impacting the mission statement and the strategic plan. So SACS can, in their view, drill down to whatever drill, whatever level they want to. They have drilled down, yes. They, they okay. looked very closely at our plans, um, at uh, whether or not we're providing evidence to support the statements that we're making. They're, they're not judging us on whether we are achieving our goals. They're judging us um, or reviewing us on whether we are seeking improvement. 
do they make an evaluation as to whether you think your strategic plan is 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 a document reality or do they? Um, no, they only uh, they only make a determination of whether the strategic plan is aligned with our type of institution. Okay. I have one last question on, um, and this is great information, but are the how do we ensure that employees? are familiar with the overarching goals that the board has agreed on and set forth. Uh, and you don't need to answer the next part of the question, but do we have a, um, you know, to ensure that there's accountability, do we have a relationship with the employees that are responsible for um, implementing these goals and attempting to reach them and, and how they're accomplishing this with their own evaluations. And because there should be a relationship that we can hold employees accountable, because again, you know, as a board, we should hold ourselves accountable that these goals are being met. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, well, this person didn't meet the goal, so let's fire them. No, it might be a goal that was unattainable for whatever reason and had to be tweaked and re but is there a relationship between the accomplishment of the goals and the employees that are responsible in their evaluations. So let me answer the, the easier question first. Um, how do employees know what you all have identified as outcomes? So, so remember, um, we, we don't expect you to do the work of crafting the nuances of the strategic mm -hmm. plan. We'll, we'll take care of that with the identifying the goals and then the outcomes. So each year when um, the budget head puts their area plan into the software system, they are required to, uh, th their um, toggles or, or their um, boxes that they check, which outcome does your plan speak to? Um, and then that's where uh, Ms. Frescas in the planning office will say, um, I'm, I'm not sure I see that. Can you help me explain why you think this plan speaks to the specific outcome? So it's self-selected. Um, and, and this is provided to the employees, to the budget head when they put in their plan. The second question uh, is a little bit tricky and it goes back to the conversation we've had about uh, empowering employees. Um, to highlight their work. And each month, the planning office, Ms. Frescas and her support staff, provide uh, each uh, cabinet division head a summary of here are the plans and here are the monthly assessments that have been submitted. And that's done uh, to ensure the division head sees, oh, this person is not doing their monthly check-ins. I need to follow up with them, or to say, oh, this department within my division hasn't submitted their plan yet, let me follow up with them. Beyond that, uh, quite frankly, Dr. Graham, it's um, w the planning office, me personally, my division, we don't, we don't overstep. I'm not going to uh, go around um, Mr. Flores and talk directly to the budget office on their plans. I'm gonna, work with Mr. Flores or with VP Shaughnessy, um, and how they use that information about their division's plans, that's up to each AVP and each AVP. <clears throat> Dr. Graham, with regards to the goals um, that the board has, has um, set through the vision and, and mission, um, every state of the college address in the fall terms, I will address those and that is broadcast to the entire staff. I'll do it at a campus and then we've, um, Mr. Fernandez and his team stream it to the rest of the campuses. Um, in addition, um, the vice presidents, when they meet with their respective teams, they go over those as well. Follow up in the spring with the town halls. I touch on those not as deeply. Um, I touch much more with regards in the town halls in the spring semesters on the activities that are occurring, whether it's legislative session and what we're gearing up for, where we are, but all of those are always influenced um, by the presentations. And then obviously when I present to the board with regards to my evaluation, then I um, uh, address those head on the goals. In addition, um, Dr. Moe and her team 
um, send out copies of the strategic plan, both in hard copy and email, to every single employee at the institution. So we do our best to ensure that everyone not only knows them, but knows our progress towards reaching those as well. Thank you, sir. And if there are no further questions, then I will turn it back to Dr. Sarafa. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I know one last slide up, at least on ours, that just went off. It said, thinking ahead mm -hmm. for the 26th through whatever. Through 31. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, is there a time frame for when we might, is the first two part goes to boards? Is there a time frame for when the board trustee then we'll come back with the mission and vision? Absolutely, so so I would recommend, and I'll, I'll ask Dr. Penley to chime in as well. So we're, we're somewhat, um, it's been a significant period of time since we've had an opportunity to have a workshop. At the same time, I'll share with the board, the work of the college never stopped. And so you'll see that the new strategic plan went forward in 21, we did bring the, uh, the mission and the vision to the board. The board reviewed those um, suggested changes, slight changes that we did implement. We turned around and we moved forward with developing the strategic plan. So it seems as if we haven't done that, but we actually did. So what I would recommend is that we're in year two of the current strategic plan, Mr. Uxer. Um, towards the end of year three, going into year four, we should really start to delve deeper into that. Um, and then by the time we get to year five, that the board has not only reviewed, but suggested changes with regards to the mission and vision. The, call it, the, the cabinet then turns around and takes that and develops the strategic plan, which we bring back to the board for final approval. And then we move forward in that direction. It's a constant, um, it's, we do these in five year cycles, but by year three, we're already reviewing. And by year five, we're ready to go with the new strategic plan. My my only suggestion yes, is to sir. use the word update rather than change. It's a great, it's a great point. You're right. We, okay. uh, we do update and, and um, they say the same thing, but it makes us look better. No, no, absolutely. I, I just, uh, the reason I, I delve into a little bit deeper thought, there's a lot of legislation and I will touch on this as I close out the day today. There's a lot of legislation that has, um, has me concerned. I, I don't know, the, I'm trying to choose my words wisely. Um, with regards to things like, Dr. Graham, you had referenced, you know, um, one of the respective goals that Dr. Penley had shared, um, which um, includes, um, includes items such as equity, things of that nature. There, there's, there's a real movement across um, states throughout the union that, um, are pushing back on such, on such um, review or such data or such offices, um, things of that nature. So there's, there's been legislation that has already been filed um, ahead of the 88th legislature that would um, eliminate any funding that goes towards um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, um, looking at whether we spend resources on that. Um, these are concerns for me just based on uh, on a number of, of items, but but there is legislation, and I want the board to be aware of it. Um, I've talked to colleagues that are from that particular part of the state, and their their thought is, if it gets on calendars, it will pass. It will. It will. It will. Okay. So it it is something that we have to be very well aware of. Um, and we'll have to find ways that we continue to, uh, Dr. Penley and I have deep discussions on where we feel we need to dive deeper. And for instance, uh, we say, okay, you know, students are gonna be successful, but are we digging deeper into male and female? Are we digging deeper into full-time and part-time? Are we digging deeper into um, race and ethnicity breakdowns of these particular segments of our student population that we're looking at? Pell versus non-Pell, part-time versus full-time, all of those uh, items that we are gonna continue to dig deeper and ensure that the institution is looking at all areas as long as we can legally do so. Can you look at um, the breakdown, or unless you already do, do you look at the breakdown from like school districts? 
We do. You do. We do. And, and so a couple of things, Ms. Sanchez, is a great question. We do it internally, but then we also, through the collaborative, I chair the, the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, uh, Dr. Wilson, myself, several superintendents, the, the big three are on there, as well as a couple of the other superintendents from smaller, Dr. Aguila from Region 19. We've included business and industry, members of Creed are now on that, some philanthropy as well. We look at this and we share this data as a group. And we will get down into um, down to the district level, and we don't share that publicly. But internally in the collaborative meetings, we can share that all the way to the district level to show here's the progress that we're making. Here is where we've seen, and it really isn't to call anyone out. It's just so that we can keep trying to get better. Right, well, and That's then great. just addressing them with correct it, whoever's that superintendent. And Absolutely, and, and in particular, if we lose, for instance, dual credit. Dual credit has been a significant part of our region's strategy, and when a, a dual credit teacher retires from a district, if the district doesn't have a replacement, then we see those numbers fall. And so we, it's really an opportunity for us as a group to come together and say, you know, here's what we're seeing, how do we address this together? Not to call anyone out, but just to continue to get better. Thank you, Dr. Penley. <laughs> and that's, that's while you work on the policies, right? <laughs> yeah, among many, many other things. So, um, Chair Haggerty, we're, we're at a point, um, it is your call whether we need to have a break. Um, lunch will be available. Lunch is available. So, it is 11.49. 1149. You guys are it, should the board um, go into lunch and should you choose to go into executive session, then we can continue with, um, we have, go ahead. Dr. Amaya's. Yeah, we have Dr. Amaya and, and Dr. Mitchell's presentation on threat assessment um, that, that we would, um, and legal counsel I, who is on the line, uh, would advise us whether we should go into executive session for that particular one. I believe that it's in our best interest to do so, just given that, uh, the topic and area that they will cover. So how, your call, Chair. How long is the, the next presentation that you have here, more or less? Dr. Amaya, Dr. Mitchell? Oh, it's <clears throat> yeah. substantial. We're, we're anticipating a lot of questions. So I would imagine that we would say an hour to Dr. an hour and a half. Dr. No. Graham started the meeting saying we couldn't ask questions. <laughs> an hour to an hour and a half is what I would, I, I would anticipate a, at least an hour and a half. So I'll correct No, I'm, I'm sorry. You said only I couldn't. <laughs> You've been given a gag order before, sir. So. <laughs> well, let's call lunch. Sir, I what? Have to leave for no, I was asking about this one. Yeah, that, that's the Dr. Smith's presentation, and that presentation is scheduled for after lunch, Dr. Graham. Okay. Yeah, if you're going to leave, then I think we should do the... The right assessment. Can, and can we do that like a working lunch? Yes, Absolutely. And the board can invite whoever the board chooses to come into executive session, and we can um, move in that direction. Would it Probably be just here? Only people that need to be. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Item. Correct. Right? So. Would it be here or in the other conference? The, the board can choose to have that in an, in either location. It would be easier if it was in the the, the conference room. You can keep it more secure. So if it's back in the conference room. She does. Okay. The Board of Trustees may conduct an executive or closed session pursuant to Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code for one or more of the following reasons. Consultation with its attorney to seek or receive legal advice. Well, consultation regarding pending or contemplated litigation or for any purpose authorized by law. Discussion about the value or transfer of real property, discussion about a prospective gift or donation, consideration of specific personnel matters, discussion about security personnel or devices, or discussion of certain economic development matters. The board may also announce that it will go into executive session on any item listed on the agenda if the subject matter is permitted for a closed session by provisions of Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. Any vote regarding these items shall be taken in open session. All right. Item 6.1, yeah, so discussion with legal counsel phone. regarding the internal oh, assessment on readiness and preparedness for active attacker incidents oh, pursuant to Section 551.089 of the Texas Government Code. 
Okay, we are returning from executive session, and uh, Ms. Pam, would you please read the next section? Okay. Uh, I'll just make note also that uh, Mr. Haggerty has, um, has left and, and will not be present for the remainder of the meeting. And Ms. Nahara is online. And Ms. Nahara is um, on virtually. And item 5.4, Dr. Steve Smith, Vice President of Instruction, will make a presentation regarding potential new instructional programs, the program review process, and implementing and scaling eight-week courses for institutional transformation. And for the record, it's 150. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention, Dr. Strada, members of the board. Uh, it's pretty exciting to be able to tell you about a couple of things that, that maybe we don't get a chance to talk about uh, very often. I know in the board meetings you see some of the great initiatives that are coming through, through the grant efforts and other things that appear on, on board agendas. Uh, but you don't always get a kind of a peek behind the curtain about how programs are established, um, how they're evaluated, um, and some of the great things that are, that are coming down the pipe in the form of uh, eight-week programs. So I've chosen one initiative to kind of talk to you about that, that's currently on the front burner uh, as well. And so I begin with a picture of Dr. Strada at our diesel. No, that's not obviously Dr. Strada, but that's one of our diesel students. Obviously very happy uh, to be in the program. Um, before I get started, I'm going to go off script a little bit just because it makes people nervous um, and go back to uh, something that Dr. Penley covered regarding the faculty credentials. Uh, I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that somebody has dropped the ball as far as credentialing faculty and putting them in the classroom. I'm going to share a little bit of information, obviously without sharing names, uh, about the circumstance of the three faculty members. So two of them are biologists, and uh, the way we credential biology faculty members is they must have a master's degree in biology or 18 graduate hours of biology, and they're credentialed for biology. The, uh, one of the challenges that we experience with SAC COC is uh, some of the standards are somewhat subjective. And so the two faculty members in biology that were questioned or are being questioned are teaching anatomy and physiology, which is part of our biology courses. And the uh, on-site reviewer looked at their coursework and said, I don't really see any uh, coursework related to anatomy and physiology. They may have come through botany or some other uh, avenue of biology. Uh, and so that's one circumstance. And then the math instructor has successfully navigated two previous SAC COC visits. And um, that individual happens to have 18, more than 18 graduate hours of math. Some of it is from the College of Math, some of it is from the College of Education. And so the on-site reviewer looked at some of the College of Education hours and thought uh, maybe they, they, sh they needed more real math and not education math. So um, there's a very robust process to credential faculty. Uh, an initial dean credentials a faculty. A second dean looks at it, also agrees. I look at it, also agrees. So there's three eyes on those. So I didn't want anyone to come away thinking that uh, any particular dean or somebody had not done due diligence in getting people into the classroom. Um, for the record, last SACS visit, uh, at this point in time, we had eight faculty. This year we have three out of the almost 1,000 faculty that we have teaching. So uh, I felt the need to clarify that. And, uh, I'm glad you did Do because Dr. it's on the record. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Smith, uh, let me just uh, as an aside, uh, when I was teaching at UTEP, um, I was I was brought in by on exception because half of my math course uh, half of my math courses uh, read physics, uh, you know, and and so they were disallowed under one particular deal because it didn't have math on the transcript. As Although a prefix. Uh, two or three of them were taught by math instructors, brought over to the physics department, you know. So yeah, it's sometimes it's uh, what's printed on a piece of paper. And, and then you have to go explain, here it is, and then you bring up a course syllabus, and, and, and sometimes they'll go through by exception, but yeah, that happens. I mean, they just look at it, and if it's not on a piece of paper that says math, well then, you know, it doesn't work. 
Our, our faculty are incredibly well qualified at the institution. Um, so what I want to talk to you today uh, is about how programs are created. I'm going to give you some insight onto a number of programs that we're currently looking at implementing. Some of them are well along the path for implementation. Some of them uh, are less so. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the timelines, you know, how long does it take to establish a program, uh, et cetera. And then how do we evaluate programs because programs don't always necessarily last forever. Uh, before I get into the presentation, uh, let me talk in broad strokes. There are several different kinds of programs and courses at the institution, and I just want to kind of make sure uh, we're all on the same page um, about that. So in general, we've got three great big categories of classes. We've got academic transfer courses, we've got career and technical education courses, and then we have developmental education courses. We also have continuing education courses uh, as well and some adult basic ed. So that there's really kind of five categories of courses. What I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, generally the, the uh, CTE and academic transfer, the programs that are credit uh, that we award certificates and associate degrees in. Um, so in that context, uh, let me move to the next slide here. Uh -oh, if I can get the clicker to work. I might need some technical, oh, there we go, okay. <clears throat> um, so let me talk to you a little bit about the approval process. Uh, if we're gonna offer a credit program, it takes a little time to get that through the approval process. So it's not something where we can decide today, uh, let's offer a program in drone technology and next week it happens. Uh, there's a, a relatively lengthy process of approvals, both internally and externally, that have to happen. Generally, um, faculty or deans will notify us in June of their intent uh, to offer or create a new program. Uh, it's generally a two-year process for an associate degree, uh, somewhat less if it's going to be a certificate of completion or an embedded certificate. Um, we have to get approvals through the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, uh, as well as through uh, SAC COC, if it's going to be financial aid eligible, the Department of Ed, et cetera. So in general, here's the process. Uh, somebody reaches out and decides they're going to have a new program. They reach out to uh, uh, me, the vice president, and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Uh, we start to ask a number of really important questions like, well, how many jobs are there if we have students that graduate from one of these programs? How expensive is the program going to be to implement? Uh, how much space would we need to implement this type of program? Is there specialized equipment, specialized accreditation? Um, all of those uh, questions begin um, the process. Um, so that I won't read the whole slide to you, obviously, but that uh, fourth bullet down, uh, it's not just solely uh, the vice president's decision or the dean's decision. We have a curriculum committee uh, that looks at the program, asks any gener uh, general questions related to it, uh, and gives approval for a, a program to move forward. Um, Dr. Serrata obviously has to be in the loop and approve, and of course that uh, Fourth from the last bullet, submit to the EPCC Board of Trustees for approval. And you've probably already seen some of them. We will have another one coming in, it looks like February, uh, that I'll highlight in a minute as one of our new programs. But all of these uh, new programs come to the board uh, for approval as well. Uh, and then we have some notifications to do. Uh, so uh, SAC COC, anytime we do a new program, uh, Julie's area gets really uh, nervous. Uh, she's responsible for helping us make sure that we dot all our I's, cross all our T's, uh, adhere to the SAC COC substantive change uh, guidelines and rules and regulations. Her team does a great job in helping us navigate that. If it was left up to us in instruction, we would just, you know, go great guns, move full steam ahead. Uh, but there are some other things, as I mentioned, the coordinating board has to approve Department of Ed. And then if there's specialized accreditation, and a lot of times in uh, health, there are accrediting agencies besides SAC COC and the coordinating board that have to uh, make sure we're uh, on the, the right page and doing what we need to do to implement the uh, program. And a lot of those uh, external accreditation requirements have to do with who oversees the program. 
Uh, for example, uh, the dean of nursing is one of the few areas where that dean has to be a registered nurse. Uh, most of the other deans we have at the institution uh, are highly qualified, but they don't have to necessarily be credentialed in the areas that they're overseeing, but the dean of nursing is different. So they make sure that we're doing all of those uh, types of things, make sure that our staffing plan for uh, hiring faculty is appropriate as, as well. How so, difficult is it, sir, to get uh, new certificates approved for an existing program? It's very easy to do, and uh, the coordinating board has actually moved to a much less rigorous process over the, the past five, six years. Um, something like that, if we have an existing program and we're gonna offer a certificate instead of just the associate degree, that happens very quickly. Most of our associate degrees, by the way, uh, especially in CTE, uh, have <coughs> embedded certificates. They have multiple exit points uh, along the two-year associate degree pathway. Uh, so where do the ideas for these new programs come from? Well, here's a list of them. Uh, coordinating board mandate, <coughs> which might not be readily apparent, but every year the coordinating board looks at <coughs> curriculum across the state and they uh, have certain mandates that come out. Um, some of them may have to do with consolidation of courses. There are 50 community colleges in the state and maybe some of them have several different flavors of a particular English class and the coordinating board consolidates it and says, nope, everybody's gonna offer this version, and so we revise our degree plans uh, pretty regularly. And uh, by the way, I will mention that uh, Dr. Mitchell is uh, our administrator overseeing all curricular issues at the institution and doing a great job. Um, in fact, uh, I, as of yesterday, I started to get the Changes from the coordinating board that we had submitted for this year, the approvals are starting to come through, and I think I'm at 30 that we had submitted already that have come through as approved for this year. Um, so the curriculum is not a static thing. Programs are not static. They evolve constantly. Uh, business and industry is a huge uh, player. This is where we get a lot of our CTE uh, input. The uh, echocardiography program I'll highlight in a minute. Many of you toured the Rio Grande building and got to see that facility, it's amazing. Uh, that came from industry demand. They're the ones that came to us initially and said, hey, we need these echo folks in, in the industry and there's a real shortage of them. And uh, so that's what uh, typically gets the ball rolling on those. Uh, of course, we deal very closely with the local workforce board uh, and, and other entities similar to that. Uh, Texas Workforce Commission, and then uh, internally, our own faculty. Uh, IT is a great example. They're the ones that have their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the industry and how their programs need to morph for change. Uh, cybersecurity is uh, probably their, their newest program in that area, which came from, uh, of course, industry trends. And then uh, our own advisory committee. So every one of our career and technical education programs has a dedicated advisory committee made, made up of practitioners in the field that look at our programs, help us understand how they need to be modified to meet local needs. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, recent programs, one in the works, uh, echocardiography. Um, hugely expensive program. Uh, thank goodness it was able to be implemented as part of the um, master planning process uh, that the board uh, helped guide the institution through. Um, and so it was funded through the master planning um, uh, fund, started in 2021 with a 10 student cohort. We're well on our way uh, through, I think, our third cohort at this time. Uh, it's a 60 credit hour uh, specialized admi uh, admissions program. Specialized admi admission simply means that there are um, some criteria that the students have to meet and there's a ranking process to get into the uh, program. Uh, currently have two disciplined faculty um, and you can see the hourly rate that our graduates get. Um, and one of the things that we look at, uh, and I'll touch more on this when we talk about how we evaluate programs, is are there ongoing needs for uh, students to enter the workforce? And there's currently 15 vacancies within a 50 mile radius of that program. Whoops, okay. I, I did not do that. Um, th this is one of the handouts that you will see. Uh, uh, in a few minutes, I'll talk about the new programs that are coming up. 
Um, this particular program, echocardiography, is also uh, one of those that requires um, specialized accreditation and uh, the Joint Review Committee on Education and Diagnostic Medical Sonography oversees that particular uh, program. So they need to be, uh, have, uh, is this part of the nursing program? It's a totally separate program. It, it's a completely separate program, uh, Dr. Graham. So one of the ones that we're implementing now is our PCT program, or Patient Care Technician Program. Um, we're working with Dr. Penley to get all the approvals. In fact, I think we just got the approvals from SAC COC. Uh, we're working with the coordinating board now. Um, this was funded as part of our TRUE initiative. So the coordinating board uh, had issued a couple of grant opportunities. One was the uh, TRUE initiative, Texas Reskilling and Upskilling, um, and help me with the E. Yeah, thank you, through education. Thank you. Uh, it was a grant funded program and so we chose to uh, focus on health for that particular one. This uh, started as a joint effort between our continuing education program and our credit programs. And what we're seeing on the landscape down the road uh, and the legislature uh, happenings at the legislature is that they're not so much interested in making sure that you know somebody has a credit degree as opposed to an industry certification. And so we're continuing to see this melding of what historically has been the purview of our continuing education department with what has historically been part of our credit program. And we're seeing a huge amount of overlap in there. And this is uh, one of our first programs, probably the first program to kind of uh, come through that process. And so the folks that helped develop this program came from uh, both Cheryl Stiles, our uh, director in our CE department, and uh, Dr. Soraya Hajar, dean over the Rio Grande Health programs. Um, we had some of the existing courses already, and so you see phlebotomy, EKG, nursing assistant, and so we created this new PCT program uh, as an offshoot of some existing program uh, courses as well as new additional courses. Um, again, I won't read the slide to you, but you can see these folks uh, earn from $38,000 to $49,000. Uh, and there's currently 33 vacancies uh, within a 50-mile radius. And so uh, we'll uh, begin to offer this program in the fall of 2024. Uh, and hopefully these students will get through there. This is a short-term certificate, uh, one-year certificate program. How short a uh, short-term is it? Uh, so it's one year in, in length. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit. There's actually five levels of certificates at the state. I'll talk about the two big ones, especially, and, and kind of uh, tell you what the differentiation is. It has to do with how many credit hours are in the program. Uh, and so this is a 15 credit hour, uh, one, one year program, 30 credit hour, excuse me, one year program. Another one that we're planning to implement in the fall of 2024 is a melding of three different areas you see on the right hand side there, uh, where healthcare, computer science, and information systems align. We have something called health information and hospitals and uh, other health sites are uh, continuing to look at uh, how data informs patient healthcare. And so uh, this helps us uh, create graduates that are gonna meet the needs of the healthcare industry. Um, and so uh, the SAC COC sub change um, is currently pending. These students will make uh, anywhere between 36,000 and 47,000 uh, a year, uh, 25 vacancies within a 50 mile radius. All right, and then. Um, and that's also a short term. Uh... Correct, it's gonna be a one year certificate as well. And then uh, we've got, I'll call it a hodgepodge, it's really not, it's a, a kind of a well thought out, uh, evolving set of courses. Um, but we look constantly for new opportunities to enroll students and create new uh, degrees and certificates. And so a couple of the ones that have come up recently, irrigation technology, uh, somebody said earlier, water is a valuable resource in our area, what can we do around that? Uh, and uh, certainly irrigation technology is something that's high on people's lists. 
uh, landscape technician logistics is huge right now, and so we've got uh, a, a large focus on logistics uh, programs and opportunities. But um, what we've got, uh, I don't have it on the screen, I'll have two separate uh, screenshots of this, um, but that kind of red box in the lower left corner of the slide, you uh, have an attachment that's a one-pager that has the data from the next two slides so that you can take that with you and uh, see um, not only the programs that we're thinking of, but who's been identified as the point of contact. And uh, yeah, thank you for pulling that up. So this is the PDF that the board has in their packet, but uh, we don't necessarily have slides on. And so uh, we've identified these programs as things that we're either thinking about, uh, those are the ones with the tilde next to them, uh, or that are actually in process. And so um, you'll see that regardless of whether we're thinking about it and exploring it or whether it's actually in process, we've identified an administrator or two administrators who are responsible to keep us updated on the, the progress of those particular programs. Uh, so you see, um, and again, I won't read the whole thing to you. Uh, and if I can go to the next slide, Uh, this is just the top part of that uh, one pager that you have on the slide. So we've got automotive technology in, in regards to electrical vehicles. Um, we don't have every program on here because uh, it would turn into a two or three pager. But in addition to electrical cars, uh, we're also um, working with the city to explore uh, possible um, installation and maintenance of electric charging stations. Uh, a program in that. And so there's some offshoots of some of these things that uh, we're exploring as well. Aviation and aeronautics, um, some of you know we've been working with UTEP on potential aviation uh, airframe and power plant programs, et cetera. Uh, you see that uh, Dr. Pagel is responsible for the auto and Dr. Valerio is responsible for uh, aviation and aeronautics. Um, number of biomedical uh, programs are in the works. Um, a lot of hospital equipment needs maintenance and repairs, and so uh, that's what that entails. Uh, we were recently approached by uh, one of the large title companies in Texas, Lone Star Title. Uh, they're experiencing some things that a lot of industries are experiencing in that their people are aging out. So all the title uh, folks in the state, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of the title uh, company folks in the state are at uh, retirement age, and so now there's a concern about how they're gonna replace those. And so we've actually um, engaged Hanover Research to help us understand if that's a program that uh, we think it's important for the college to understand. And again, it'll be based on a number of things, including how many job openings uh, there will be in the industry and what kinds of jobs uh, it will be. Right now, uh, the plan uh, as it currently stands is to uh, create this as uh, part of our real estate program. So it might be a certificate underneath our real estate program uh, rather than a standalone uh, program itself. And I won't read the, the rest of you uh, this to you, but um, I will point out that uh, you've seen uh, many grants come through related to item F competency-based education. You've seen some really large grants come through in the past six or eight months uh, related to that. Uh, we just received SAC COC uh, approval to move forward with our uh, CBE uh, programs. Uh, CBE will fit nicely in our uh, eight-week program that, uh, at uh, Mission that I'll talk about after a little bit as well. Uh, construction management, data analytics, hydraulics, and it continues on to the next page. Um, all of the, and again, I won't read all of these to you, some of the more interesting ones that have come up recently, museum studies, that's something we were approached by the Walton Foundation. Uh, they came and met with us and said, hey, we're worried about uh, having enough people to work in museums and be docents and uh, uh, all the careers that go into that. Uh, and so we're exploring those right now. Uh, item S might be interesting to some of you. We've been looking at mortuary science um, evidently, there's a uh, real need in the industry out there. Uh, we're all going to need their services at some point. Uh, but yeah, um, training people in, the, in that field, um, there's nobody in the area that does that. And so people have to go to San Antonio or into, well, into northern New Mexico 
to see programs related to that. I was surprised that several students are leaving town to go pursue that particular degree. Uh, I'm not aware of, of them leaving to do that, but they would have to at this point, right? What about the family college? What is that one about? That, that's interesting. So family college isn't necessarily a program, but what it is, it's an effort for us to coordinate um, for parents that have to work services for children at the same time that we're offering classes. And so we've, you'll see that that particular one had, uh, I think, three deans uh, associated with it. Uh, or three administrators associated with it. Um, so there's a coordinated effort. Let's say somebody works all day, but we want them to come to school at night, but they have kids, so we're going to set up a children's program at night uh, or on the weekend so their parents can come to school, put their kids into either a program or associated daycare while they go to school, and then they can pick up their children as they leave. and. Uh, we're also uh, working on family-friendly spaces throughout the district. We've already identified a number of facilities. These are spaces like computer labs where traditionally we don't allow children in. And uh, so uh, parents would be able to bring children into these particular facilities uh, as they do their homework and access uh, services on campus. Your suggestions are always welcome, Dr. Graham. This is something that you know that you and other members of the board have brought to our attention on a number of occasions, and we take them seriously. See, we should have a child development center at every campus. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Just find the space. Uh, and the, the good news is, and I'm a little off topic here, but the, the timing for new programs is perfect. With the master planning that we've done, uh, that you've helped create and fund, uh, we have opportunities to dedicate spaces. So for example, if at VV we created the AST building where we've moved all of our uh, engineering programs into that building, well, they've vacated other spaces in other facilities, right? And so it's the perfect time to begin to look for uh, either expanding current programs into those spaces or developing new programs to put into those spaces. So it's a perfect comment. I, I just keep seeing the numbers of teachers that we are trying to staff and the number keeps growing and growing and candidates are minimal. You're, you're talking about at the district? Mm -hmm. We're experiencing the same thing. Uh, it, it's increasingly difficult to attract uh, as Mr. Lobato was talking about earlier, uh, uh, we're having the same thing, attracting instructors uh, and other instructional support staff, tutors, et cetera. So we're seeing it across the board. One that's really interesting is, uh, and you see we ran out of letters, so we had to start using double letters. Uh, <coughs> AA, so um, part of our... Uh, Why are you making? Yeah. Anyway, um, that is an interesting happy to answer any questions related What's it to associated with the double A? <laughs> <laughs> it was coincidence, <laughs> purely coincidence. Yeah. Probably not the wisest choice of lettering on that particular one, and it, it never even crossed my mind until now. Uh, but very good. Uh, so anyway, um, we're, we're thinking all the time uh, about what potential new programs might be put in place. So those of you that, uh, those that you see on there that either have, and I know there was one that said priority, if it's in process or priority, we ask the deans associated working on those for regular updates at our instructional leadership meetings. So uh, we get updates on these uh, uh, pretty regularly on those that are moving forward. Uh, any questions before I, I move on with these? No, this is a good list. If you think of any others that aren't on the list. We can add them to the list. <laughs> happy to explore adding them to the list, yeah. Uh, just some general information. Um, so we've got over 150 programs. Um, I don't know if that's the right number. It's a good number. Uh, most of these are extremely healthy. I'll talk about how we, uh, you know, kind of evaluate them in just a minute. Um, but you see up there for the Associate of Arts degrees, uh, we've got 19 different Associate of Arts degree programs, 50 Associate of Applied Science degrees, and those are our career and technical education uh, courses, and then Associate of Science, we've got 13 different programs. 
Uh, I mentioned the certificates of completion and those of you that uh, attend, I guess we all attend uh, commencement, know that that's part of our commencement ceremony, those certificates of completion. And they fall into several different categories. You see that there's five different versions of certificates of completion. Um, uh, really, the ones we focus on are the level one and level two certificates. So a level one certificate contains anywhere between 15 to 42 credit hours. A level two certificate has 30 to 51. There's a little bit of overlap. And as it turns out, in, in some cases, we have leeway about whether we want to call it a level one or level two certificate. Uh, the others are very short term uh, programs. Uh, of course, you're familiar with our uh, continuing education uh, certificates. We've got any number of those. But the enhanced skill certificates and advanced technical certificates are, are very specialized and we don't have very many of those. Uh, total number of courses, these are individual separate courses that we have at the institution. There's 1,024 of those. Uh, and I alluded to the difference between kind of transfer level courses and technical courses. So there's 355 um, transfer level courses, 71 of those are core courses, and uh, 669 technical courses, CTE. So those include things like nursing and welding and cosmetology, et cetera. Um, and then we just threw a couple of uh, information items over on the right-hand side. So every year we go through processes where we revise courses or add courses or remove courses. And you can see uh, for last year, well, we added nine new courses. We closed 15 courses, shut those down. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, program level changes uh, next. Uh, this is kind of what I alluded to before, so uh, we had a number of course revisions and additions, and these are just some definitions. One of the terms you may hear that may not make a lot of sense is the word DACUM. It's an acronym. It stands for Developing a Curriculum. Every CTE program is required to have a DACUM every five years. Uh, I did not do that either, I don't think. Uh, every five years. And... Um, so what that is, is we bring industry practitioners to a meeting and we walk them through our current curriculum and we ask them what a graduate would need to know to get a job in their particular field. And we go through an exercise where we marry those two. And so um, we mentioned IT changes very, very rapidly. Um, well, five years is a long time in IT. So some of these programs we have DACUMs more often, um, but you can imagine that when we create a program, <laughs> by the time five years has elapsed, uh, the, the competencies needed to be in that field have probably changed dramatically. So we don't just invent that ourselves, we pull industry experts in and, and we collectively revise these programs. And sometimes we shorten them, sometimes we eliminate them. Um, more often than not, we uh, tweak the courses that are contained within a particular uh, degree. All right, so let me talk a little bit about how we evaluate the program. So we've got 150 of these programs. Uh, how do we make sure that um, they're viable? Uh, well, we have a very robust program review process. Uh, so I, I like to say we have three really hardworking committees uh, at the college. Now, all of the committees are important and do good work. Program Review Committee is an intensive uh, committee process. I'll talk about the makeup in a minute. It's one of our longer procedures. Um, curriculum is another one, and of course our tenure process is also uh, quite rigorous as well. Uh, but the purpose, and I will read this to you, to assess the current and future viability of all credit and non-credit instructional programs and to make recommendations on program improvement and viability. And so every year, uh, we go through a process where we uh, develop um, metrics. And uh, well, we don't develop the metrics. We, we score the metrics for every program. And then we have a committee that looks at the performance of every one of these programs. There's a link at the bottom of that page. Anyone can go out to that link. All of our program inf uh, review information is out there. The success uh, metrics of all of our programs are documented out there. There's no secrets. Um, and so what the Program Review Committee does is they make recommendations to administration about what should happen to a program. Um, 
Most of the time, the, the recommendations have to do with ways to improve programs. Uh, every once in a while, they have a recommendation to either eliminate a program, uh, convert a program to continuing education instead of credit, or even vice versa, uh, or to embed a program into another program. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. So anyone can go out there and look at all of these um, uh, program review documents anytime they want to. Dr. Smith, do we have on the, um, the program review, do we have some of our uh, younger people in there, either the younger faculty or uh, students that we can elicit feedback from them as well? So we don't have an age requirement on the committee members, uh, and we don't have students on it. That's actually a, a pretty good uh, suggestion. Here's the makeup of the committee, 21 members. Uh, they come from career and technical ed, credit transfer, CE as well. And then we have a librarian, a counselor, an administrator, uh, other than non-credit. And then we do have the professional classified staff folks, as well as the faculty association president on there. Um, might not be a bad idea to add students. Well, because we need to hear the younger voices because, again, their, their view of the world is different from those of us that are a little bit more experienced. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Uh, so that's the makeup of the committee. Uh, and then there's some resource people on there. Uh, by the way, Dr. Penley's area is the one responsible for developing the program review report. So it's not self-reported data. It's not programs presenting their own view of the world. It's uh, easily measurable metrics uh, developed by the college and um, um, comes out of Dr. Penley's area. So uh, she has resources, uh, people on there, the curriculum office does, the budget, admissions, and of course I serve as a resource person, non-voting member of that committee as well. So this is a college-wide committee. It is not uh, instruction only. And how often do they meet? Um, the report comes out every year and they evaluate programs every year. How often they meet is dictated by how many programs need to come before the program review committee. So I would say on average they probably meet six to eight times a year. Okay. And, and when they're actually evaluating programs and interviewing faculty from the programs, uh, they're meeting like every week or every other week as they go through that process. So you see on the lower left-hand corner, there's another attachment uh, that's associated with it. What I've done is that link that was on the previous slide, I've pulled two programs off of that and uh, put the program review reports in your packet. Uh, you can see that they're incredibly detailed, right? So the metrics that we use to evaluate the programs um, run the gamut from the number of graduates to the retention level, to whether graduates are getting employment. Um, there's a number of viability indicators. Uh, thank you. If you could scroll down one page on that, on that PDF. Can I do it? Click it, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what's happening is they're switching between PDFs and, and the PowerPoint for me. Um, and I chose this one because it's very colorful. No, I, I didn't. Um, so when uh, the program review uh, committee meets, um, they've, you can start to see the, the uh, criteria that they use in this particular page is looking at viability uh, indicators. So the very first one is how many graduates, right? The number of graduates. And um, Dr. Penley's area has been very creative in helping the committee do its work effectively and they've come up with a green, yellow, red color coding scheme. So it's easy to see at a glance that this particular program, which is business, uh, looks great for the number of graduates, right? Uh, the next one down, student success, you can see that it's yellow. That's because the standard is 90%. So 90% of our students are either transferring, getting employed, or going into the military. Those, those are the definitions of success for this particular <coughs> metric. Um, so we're very close, so 89%, uh, 85%, et cetera. But it is yellow, and the committee will ask the discipline uh, on ways that they plan to address uh, employment and transfer in the programs when they meet, if they need to meet with the committee. 
the next two are great, but then you start to see some red. So class fill rates, and unfortunately, during the pandemic, um, we had to suspend some of these metrics, right? Uh, there, there was a fill rate, right? But we changed it because everything went online, right? And so we're, we're kind of taking some of these numbers with a grain of salt until um, uh, this past year when we started to get back to normal operations. Um, but these are the things that will cause a program to need to be appear before the program review committee. And so if a program fails 50% of its viability indicators or more, uh, the committee will ask them to appear and uh, answer questions, make a presentation about uh, plans to address any kind of low scoring metrics for a particular program. And then the program review committee will offer their own suggestions to the programs on how to strengthen or improve. Ultimately, if a program continues to, you know, present challenges to the program review committee, there may be a recommendation to either close it or uh, consolidate it in some other manner. So this is one example, and you can see it goes on for several pages on quality indicators as well. So we've got um, uh, viability indicators, and then we've got quality indicators. Uh, and in fact, let me back up and point out a couple of quality indicators. Uh, so on the quality indicators, you'll see things like, are the students satisfied with the programs? Yes, we do survey students and get their input. Are the employers satisfied? Are the advisory committees satisfied? Um, we'll see things like in, under instructional support, the very bottom line that's on the slide now, full-time faculty development. Are full-time faculty going to the requisite number of faculty development uh, sessions? And then if I go to the next page, you'll see the one at the top. We ask the same thing for our part-timers. Are they going to the faculty development sessions as well? All right, if I can go back to the uh, uh, actual presentation, please. And so you have that for both business management and uh, dental hygiene in your packet. And so you can kind of see how in-depth we look at uh, programs uh, here at the college. So. Uh, just a couple of things, you've already seen this on the uh, actual uh, PDFs, but uh, we do a three-year rolling average as we look at the metrics, so we look at the last three years. Uh, we don't look at a single snapshot in time. And then a lot of them are measured by a yes or no. Uh, one that's met uh, addressed like that is do we have enough sections for full-timers to make their workload in a particular program, yes or no. All right, so after they look at all of those things, the strength of the program, any extenuating circumstances for a particular uh, program, uh, I'll, I'll tell you one extenuating circumstance that came up uh, for uh, nursing. So we had uh, some uh, pretty extensive changes in the nursing testing. And so we had a little bit of a drop in uh, pass rates for nursing. This is, I'm going back about five years now. Uh, because they had implemented a new test and um, systems hadn't caught up uh, to make sure students were, were well prepared. And so part of the um, uh, explanation from the committee uh, that they were asking faculty, or how are you gonna address that? And, and they, they did, they implemented uh, through a grant actually, a number of additional tutoring sessions and uh, uh, some preliminary testing, some pre-testing before they actually set for the NCLEX. And that continues to this day. That has a high rate of success. Very high, yep. Uh, in fact, the metric in that program is 90%, and we're above that, yeah. Uh, very strong for both LVN and RN. Uh, and then here's some possible recommendations. So if a committee, if a program goes before the committee the first year, they're given some corrective actions. We realize that uh, some of those actions may take more than a year. And so we're asking, when they um, come back the second year, we're asking them, how's it going? Here's some other things that you can do to improve. Ultimately, um, the committee will make a recommendation if they continue to show up. And let me show you what the uh, process uh, for that is. The committee chair will inform the vice president, myself, um, through a memo on their committee recommendations. I'll have a conversation with Dr. Serrata if I concur or want to modify any of those. 
it's a joint decision about uh, the final dispensation of that particular program review cycle. That's Dr. Estrada's hand, I think. Um, just a couple of things I'll, I'll point out over the program review um, last few years. So um, after the uh, anthropology program came before the committee a couple of times, we, we chose to close that uh, particular program. Uh, and it remains closed to this day. It just never had enough students. Uh, we were down to a single faculty member. They couldn't make their workload. Uh, even after a couple of attempts to, to bolster enrollment, it, it just didn't happen. So we, we closed that program. Um, in 2018-19, we uh, included CE programs. So prior to that, we did not evaluate CE programs in the same manner we evaluate credit programs. And so we uh, modified that. And then uh, it's not on the, the uh, slide here, but it, in that same time frame, uh, our secretarial science or professional administration program at that time had gone before the program review committee a couple of times. We subsequently revised that program. If you look in the catalog now, it's an option under the business program. So it's a one-year certificate underneath the business program now uh, because it, it was not a viable standalone associate degree anymore. And then as I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of suspended some of the uh, metrics for program review during the pandemic, but we started the normal process back up. All right, um, any questions before I talk about the eight-week campus, an incredibly exciting initiative? Good. All right, so um, the uh, Texas Success Center had approached the college, uh, actually a couple of times, on whether we were interested in uh, working on a pilot project to uh, develop eight-week classes. Now, you might ask yourself, don't we already have eight-week classes? We actually do, we have quite a few. We've got five-week, eight-week, 10-week, we got, it runs the whole gamut. Uh, but what we're talking about is at scale. And what we realized is as an institution, we're probably not well positioned to move entirely eight weeks. So I asked the deans, um, do we have a campus uh, that would be interested in piloting this? And so uh, Joshua Villalobos, uh, campus dean out at our Mission Del Paso campus, volunteered. Uh, he's doing great things out at that campus. And so uh, what we did is commit to a pilot year, uh, actually a planning year, uh, along with some other uh, cohort members under uh, the mentorship of Odessa College. So Odessa College moved to eight weeks um, eight week classes a number of uh, years ago and has seen huge success in as far as student retention and completion. Uh, and so we're actually in a cohort uh, with Austin Community College, Houston Community College and Weatherford College uh, in our planning year to implement eight week uh, classes. Um, before I progress further, I do want to dispel um, something that immediately comes to mind. This is not an effort to speed up degree completion. If you do the math, you know, a student can probably take four classes in 16 weeks. Well, they can only take two in eight weeks. They, you know, four in eight weeks would be a lot. So they end up taking the same number of classes in a 16 week semester. What eight weeks does is provides a number of benefits both to the student and the institution, so let me talk about uh, that a little bit. So what's good for a student uh, in an eight-week class? Well, they have more time on task. They're also focusing on two classes instead of four classes, uh, and the associate midterms and et cetera. Um, so they're much more likely to be retained uh, in that particular class for a short eight-week term than a 16-week <coughs> term. And as a result of being retained in the class, they're much more likely to actually eventually succeed on the end and, and get through the program and get a, a degree. Uh, it also gives the institution some benefits uh, as well as the students. So one of the, the main benefits is it gives students multiple on-ramps into the institution. So instead of just coming in in uh, you know, August or September and again in January, uh, we've doubled the opportunities for them to start their career here with us in, at EPCC. So obviously in a, in a fall semester, they'll, they'll get to start in August and there will also be a start in October. Uh, so if for some reason they get behind uh, or do have to drop out, they can immediately get back in 
to the class uh, the next eight weeks. They don't have to wait till the 16 week semester's over and, and pick it back up again. What are some examples of those courses that, that you're looking at? So uh, at Mission, what we're doing, so Mission is gonna become our eight week campus. Uh, and I'll talk about how we'll evaluate it and, and all that sort of stuff. But not all the classes will become eight weeks. Um, so you see that second to the last bullet, about 90% of our transfer courses will become uh, eight week. Um, there's dual credit uh, and early college high school classes at Mission. Um, those students in the ISDs probably are not positioned to uh, jump into an eight week uh, set of, of classes. Uh, we are talking to our ISD partners to see if we can get that to line up. There may be some classes um, that are already shorter than eight week. So there could be some classes, as you may know, LVN is out at our Mission El Paso. There could be some classes that are shorter already out there. We're not gonna extend those. Uh, and the faculty may have some classes that they deem uh, can't be offered in an eight week uh, fashion. So we'll keep those at either 10 or, or 16 week. Um, so the majority of these classes will be the transfer level uh, core courses that are gonna be offered at Mission. Um, and as we said, uh, no dual credit or college high schools are currently slated to be offered in eight week, but we will keep our options open if, if that works out. Um, so what happens in our, our planning year and, and what, what is different about eight weeks versus uh, this uh, 16 week traditional system? So uh, Dean Villalobos is working with his faculty to bolster early alert systems. We already have an early alert system at the institution. Um, it's voluntary for faculty to participate. Uh, Josh is making it mandatory at, at his campus, uh, as well as standardizing all of the Blackboard shells. So faculty have a lot of leeway generally about how they present their online courses. Uh, at Mission Del Paso, we're gonna standardize those so they all look the same, so students don't get confused as they're trying to navigate through there. There's also an evaluation component of the uh, Blackboard shells. That's the quality control uh, bullet that you see there. And then um, really interesting is uh, the mandatory student support. Uh, this doesn't mean that you know, faculty have to do that, they will, but this is gonna be mandatory for the students. Uh, we're gonna require them to go to office hours for faculty, for, to the tutoring center, to the writing center, uh, et cetera. Um, the way that Dean Villalobos is scheduling his uh, classes out there, and I'll talk more about the timelines and everything in a minute, uh, Fridays, uh, he will be holding professional development for the faculty at that campus uh, to make sure that we're aware of any unforeseen circumstances as we go down that, this road, uh, that we address any challenges that faculty are experiencing early uh, in a timely manner. And so uh, he's gonna do that for the first uh, year, uh, have uh, weekly faculty development sessions. I mentioned the family friendly part of it already. We're looking at that district wide, but it's a real focus out at Mission. Uh, Dean Villalobos has already identified the facilities for this. Uh, and then um, even prior to this initiative, we created a campus welcome center out there uh, at Mission. And so a lot of things are gonna be happening that may be a little bit different at Mission than we're seeing uh, maybe district wide. Dr. Smith, the Family Friendly Center, I, I don't know if the lady called you, but she approached me about wanting to open a YWCA uh, care there at that particular campus. I gave her the dean's uh, name and yours. A absolutely, please put them in contact with us. Um, as I said, the timing is good uh, for places that will need space, right? Because we, we haven't allocated all the empty space so when people have moved to the new facilities. So the timing would be good for that. So by all means. Um, there's been some challenges. It's not all clear cut, right? Uh, any kind time you have some major changes to uh, a system, there's some things that need to be addressed. Uh, Dean Villalobos is doing a fabulous uh, job addressing any questions that faculty have. Uh, there haven't been any major concerns uh, regarding faculty. Uh, we are giving them some uh, compensation related to the uh, fact that they have to readjust all their classes to a new <coughs> format. 
uh, and that will be in place for the, the first year that we're going to do that. Um, faculty were concerned about things like workload. Uh, um, there were some um, kind of unfounded rumors that they were going to lose their spring break. We assured them that that wasn't going to be the case. Uh, but those kind of things uh, come up, and uh, Dean Villalobos is addressing those very well. Uh, faculty workload is something that we'll keep an eye on. Uh, so currently faculty in general, it, it's a complex thing, but in general faculty teach five classes as part of their workload. They have the ability to do additional classes as overloads and how we, how they're experiencing that in eight week um, semesters is, is something that we'll keep an eye on. Uh, it could mean that uh, a faculty member, for example, might get uh, paid more the first, you know, eight weeks of a semester and less in the second eight weeks of a semester, depending on how many overloads they do. But anyway, we'll keep a, an eye on that. Uh, and then we've been working very, very closely with some of the other areas of the college, including uh, uh, Dr. Amaya's areas, to make sure that various student support services are available to them. Um, so we've already finalized the fall 2023 schedule. Uh, it's in place now. Uh, for eight-week classes, um, which was a major initiative, as you can imagine, um, from a mathematical perspective, a logistics perspective, if all of your classes, let's say you have 500 classes at 16-week semesters, and they're all of a sudden all going to be twice as long <coughs> than eight weeks, you know, there's a lot of manipulation and, and logistics that go into that. So he's done a great job out there making sure that that's in place. Um, he's working with Dr. Moe's area to develop uh, uh, actually, there's going to be a new website for it, uh, some promotional materials to get the word out. Uh, we think it's going to be a big draw for that campus. Um, and then, uh, as I said, uh, we're meeting with other departments, uh, including IT. Uh, there may be some additional needs for technology for those students to make sure they don't get further behind. Um, you can get behind pretty quick in eight weeks if you're not keeping up. And so. Uh, if uh, Dean Villalobos hasn't already reached out to you, uh, Mr. Fernandez, he, he will be, yeah, uh, to, to explore this. Um, so how are we going to measure it? Um, in general, it's going to be pretty straightforward. So we're going to look at students enrolling in eight-week classes, make, uh, making sure that their retention is there, making sure they're on track, making sure they successfully complete the courses, and we will compare that with traditional 16-week success rates and retention rates, et cetera. Um, we'll look at the enrollment in those courses. If students are opting to not enroll in those courses for whatever reason, uh, we'll uh, take a look at that and uh, see if we, there are ways that we can mitigate that. Students might be scared of enrolling in eight-week classes. That sounds pretty fast. So we'll see that. And then the gold standard, of course, is completion rates. Are they successfully getting through the programs in larger numbers than our traditional 16-week students? So those are some of the metrics that we are... I think it'd be great if we advertise this particular program to the military families or military-connected families. Yeah, thank you for your, your texts earlier. I think, uh, I think you're right. I think that's nail on the head. Um, I, especially if they don't the, know that they're going to be here for the full right, semester. Yeah. They don't know if they're going to be here for the whole semester, and that's one of the things that they've shared with me when I bring up, why don't you enroll in college while you're here? Uh, because we don't know how long we'll be here, you know, and I don't want to lose the credit or the time that I've spent, but, you know, along those lines, I had suggested to Dr. Serrata, and he said he was going to consider, uh, in consultation with you all, that perhaps the week of Thanksgiving, because I see you're going to start this in the fall of 23, that the week of Thanksgiving, when we have all the kids out, but we have college classes going on, that faculty and students would have the option of uh, transitioning to online classes that week for those parents that, again, looking at the military, that travel out of the area, that's the week that they, that they go out of town. And they could still continue with their classes if they could access the online instruction at that time. Just to give you an idea, SISD alone has 6,600 military-connected children. So you can see how many, uh, and I know APISD has probably more than that. But that could be, now that we've had to deal with uh, online instruction, that might be another incentive that 
I don't want to take off because then I'm, I can't go on vacation on that week, but if I have the option that I can still take off because we're going to be allowed to go on online instruction that week, then we're matching the calendars with the ISDs since the, all the ISDs are on the same calendars. I uh, can certainly uh, start to explore that with the faculty association and, and see what their thoughts are along those lines. I think some faculty would, would probably not mind transitioning online that week at all. Uh, others might have some other uh, challenges that don't come to mind at the moment. But we can certainly start having that conversation. I, I know it is an issue um, not only with uh, classes that students are taking, but daycare as well, because all those students are off. Uh, and we're still in session the first three days of that particular week. Um, so here's some key accomplishments, things that have already happened. Um, we formed a core team, uh, not only the campus team that uh, Dean Villalobos is leading, which consists largely of his coordinators and, and faculty, uh, but also core administrative teams. So uh, several of us uh, from financial aid, registration, instruction, um, HR, uh, have been involved in the uh, core team and planning uh, for this. Um, we've made a financial, uh, obviously, commitment. Uh, as we go through the planning year, there's some travel and some other costs that uh, are associated with this particular project. Uh, we've already developed a fall 2023 eight-week schedule. And uh, Dean Villalobos has already taken two teams of um, faculty and staff out to Odessa College uh, because there's nothing more valuable for a faculty member than to talk to another faculty member at the other institution, right? We, as administrators, can say what a great thing this will be and this is the direction we're going, but until they get to talk to their actual colleagues uh, at the other institution, um, it, it means much more to them than having administration tell them. And they, uh, both, from both of those meetings, they came back just really energized because uh, Odessa is seeing some large success in this. And then, uh, of course, Josh keeps us regularly updated, not only at leadership, but he's also made presentations at uh, Cabinet. Um, he also made presentations at the Texas Pathways Conference that we uh, had uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, and so we're, we're well on track for a fall 2023 20, opening. All right, and that's what I have. I'm happy to entertain any questions. I think that's great. You've got you headed in the right direction. All right, thank you. Anybody Sorry. else has any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Graham, I am the only uh, individual that is between you and the rest of your Saturday. I need to check in with the board to see if you all are prepared um, to go through one more presentation. How long is your presentation, sir? It's an hour and a half, Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I should be able. <laughs> I should. I should be able to get through it probably within twenty to thirty minutes. Okay, let's do, do it. Depending on the number of questions. Did agreement? you say five to seven? <laughs> That's only if there's no questions. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, so would you like me to go ahead and read the next item? Do we have anyone that objects to that? If not, we'll go through. Okay. Yes, Pim. Item 5.5, .5, Dr. William Sadatha, college president, will make a presentation regarding the final Texas Community College Finance Commission recommendations and a preview of the 88th legislative session. Thank you, Dr. Graham and members of the board. And we certainly appreciate your, your time and patience this weekend. Um, Dr. Smith, this is the controller? Yes. Ah, interesting. There we go. So the, um, the Texas Community College Finance Commission um, is, they have submitted their recommendations and I have um, on a number of occasions indicated to the board that we would provide those. They, they submitted their final recommendations in, in uh, mid, uh, it was November 17th if I'm not mistaken. We had already posted our agenda and therefore could not provide that update in November. So I wanted to provide uh, the board with uh, an indication of where we are and some, some background information first and foremost. So pre-pandemic, uh, the, the 50 community colleges in the state of Texas actually enrolled over 50% of all higher education enrollment in the state of Texas. Um, the pandemic impacted community colleges 
significantly more that it impacted universities. And so we currently um, have 45% of all enrollment, all post-secondary enrollment is in community colleges across the state. We currently award 93% of all career and technical education um, degrees and certificates. So level one certificates in associate of applied sciences. Um, there's been a lot of, of uh, attention paid to the Texas State Technical College system, the TSTC system. Uh, TSTCs generate the other 7%. So just for context, um, El Paso Community College is larger than all of the TSTCs combined. So they, they do good work, um, but by and large, um, the, the bulk of all CTE programs, and really that is an indication from my perspective of where we're headed with regards to the Texas Community College Finance Commission um, we will we produce 93% of those particular degrees and certificates. 92% uh, of all dual credit students that are enrolled in the state of Texas are enrolled through the community college system. Uh, and then 70% of uh, baccalaureate degree earners in the state of Texas have some uh, community college credit on their transcripts. So we continue to uh, do the bulk of the work in the state of Texas. Here's an indication of enrollments, and this is the latest enrollment. This was preliminary fall 22 data. As you can see, the universities um, in, in the first year of the pandemic, in the fall of 2020, they grew approximately uh, 7,000 students. They went from or just under 10,000, right? From 657,000 to 667. Uh, they certified in the fall of 21, 665, they actually fell slightly, and their preliminary enrollment was at just short of 668,000 for the fall of 22. Community colleges were over 700,000 students in 19. We saw a significant impact from the pandemic falling to a little over 650,000. We, in the fall of 21, we felt that impact once again, uh, not at the same level, but we did feel it to about 639,000. And fortunately, it seems that the sector as a whole has hopefully seen uh, the bottom of that enrollment decline. We saw a slight enrollment increase up to about 640,500 students in the fall of 22. So a slight percentage increase, but overall you see the fall to 19 to fall 22, about an 11.8% decrease. Um, there's the, the public, state, and technical colleges. The reason that you see these, um, this is the Lamar institutions. So Lamar as well as the Texas State Technical Colleges combined. Uh, they went to, from 20,000 to 25,000. This fall they're up at 26,000. Uh, so they, they've seen a rather significant increase. Uh, students are choosing higher education, but they want to choose education and ensure that they're going into a living wage position, a skill or a, a degree or certificate that will provide that leverage. Um, Health-related institutions have continued to grow through the pandemic. These are our medical schools, primarily our medical schools, and then our independent colleges and universities um, have seen slight growth as well. But I, I remind not just the Commissioner of Higher Education, but our legislators as well. In the fall of 19, Texas was at 1.56 million students. Uh, we fell to just short of 1,497,000, 1, fell further to 1,490,000. I remind everyone, our state grew during those particular um, years. So the fact that we're now at uh, just short of 1.5 million students in higher education is still a real concern from my perspective and one that we need the legislature to continue to have at the for forefront. We produce, again, these are total certificates and degrees awarded. If you look back at 2001, the 50 community colleges were producing um, a little over 36,000, just a little over 37,000 uh, degrees and certificates. In 2011, we had grown that um, to about 44,000 uh, level one certificates and associate of applied science degrees and about 33,500 academic certificates and degrees. By fall of 21, um, you see the number of degrees and certificates that we were producing. So the 50 community colleges have been focused on completion for the last 20 years, and we see the results of that. Um, the Texas community colleges, obviously you know this better than anyone. You have fiduciary responsibility for the institution. We're funded through three main sources of revenue, state appropriations, 
local property taxes and tuition and fees. That's the same for all 50 community colleges. Now, here's what's happened over the last, just as the, the last 11 years. You see back in 2010, the lines were all rather close to each other, about a third, a third, a third, roughly. Um, and what we've seen is over the last uh, 11 years, local taxes now are about 47% of funding for community colleges. State appropriations have fallen to about 23% and tuition and fees are at about 30% of uh, funding for community colleges. So in the last legislative session, in, in the 87th legislative session, we we put forward uh, Senate Bill 1230 so that the legislature could look at this, and it was re relating to the establishing of the Texas uh, Commission on Community College Finance. That passed on May 7th, 2021. You see the commission goal shall make recommendations for consideration by, by the 88th legislature for establishing a state funding formula, funding levels sufficient for sustaining viable community college education and training offerings throughout the state. So we took the work that um, had gone in in the 2019 session on public school finance. We felt that it was, uh, our funding mechanism had been in place for approximately, in, in 2023, our funding mechanism has been in place for 50 years. So we felt it was time that uh, the state legislature looked at it. And so we were fortunate that the governor signed that. Uh, they were appointees um, by, the, by the governor, the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the house. Uh, the governor appointed Mr. Hunt to chair the committee. He appointed four members. Um, the lieutenant governor appointed four members as did the speaker of the house. And so you see the members of that, Senator Creighton, Chair Creighton, who's going to chair um, the higher, the education committee. Uh, the legislature or the Senate chose to merge higher education, which Chair Creighton was the chair of, and public education. So there'll be one committee, the education committee that Chair Creighton will chair. Um, and he has agreed that he will continue to, to chair the subcommittee on higher education. Dr. Escamilla, the president of Del Mar, was appointed uh, chancellor head from Lone Star. Dr. Brenda Hellyer from San Jack. Um, Mr. Brian Jones uh, was appointed from Odessa College. Dr. Brenda Case from Kilgore College. Representative Longoria from South Texas. Uh, Ms. Scott, uh, who is one of your colleagues, she's on the Board of Regents at Del Mar College. Uh, she at that time was the chair of the Board of Regents. She was appointed Senator Taylor, the former Senator Taylor, who we will miss, Representative Van Deaver from the Te Texas House of Representatives, and then C uh, the CEO for the Commit Partnership, Mr. Todd Williams, who was instrumental on in public school financing, uh, was also appointed. The Community College Finance Committee, they met, uh, their first meeting was November 15th of 2021. Uh, they had the full commission met a total of seven times. Uh, they broke into three different work groups, college operations, student supports, and workforce policy and or education. Uh, their final report timeline on the 12th of September, they issued a final draft report. We, the, the 50 community colleges, uh, through the Texas Association of Community Colleges, had the opportunity to weigh in, share our feedback with to Commissioner Keller. On October the 18th, they presented an updated draft. They unanimously approved those recommendations, and the final report was published on November the 17th. Um, the legislative session starts on Tuesday. So what we tried to do and what we um, tried to look at was to go from a static formula, which is what essentially would occur. Every legislative session, they would say, okay, here's the pie. It's gonna be $1.8 billion and the 50 community colleges, you subdivide that respective pie. So it was a static formula and we're looking at going to a dynamic formula. And so this is one that we certainly appreciate the possibilities of looking at a dynamic formula and one that we are certainly excited about. We had, uh, in the draft recommendations that came forward, we had made some specific recommendations back to the commissioner and to uh, Mr. Hunt as chair of the committee. Uh, one was that, uh, that dual credit courses uh, that apply towards dual credit with a purpose, if you will, would be a, a, a recommendation that would go in. That was done, that was added to the recommendations. Um, we talked about a unif uh, unif we went from terminology going from uniform tuition. We didn't feel that it was 
That was the proper term to maximum dual credit tuition rate. That's recommendation 2.2. Um, hold harmless language. This was something that was incredibly important to Senator Taylor. And in the last meeting uh, that they held in person, he put forth the recommendation that there be hold harmless. However, it would be a temporary hold harmless. And so it is one legislative session. So this legislative session will have a hold harmless provision so that institutions are not hurt. So what we're looking at is um, the level of state appropriations that was received in the 87th legislative session, you would not know community college will receive less than that. But it is a one term, one, one biennium hold harmless provision. The concern was that there, there was hold harmless placed in other legislation. Um, I don't want to call anyone out. There was hold harmless placed in other legislation for other entities and it continues. It was placed 20 years ago and it continues to this date. They did not want to do that. What they said is we'll have a one biennium hold harmless and then we'll move forward from that. And the last thing was that they provided the commissioner with some uh, discretionary authority to deal with unintended con consequences. So as we've gone forward, enrollment has obviously fallen. So if that causes an institution to, th to have uh, to have their, their appropriations cut, then the, the commissioner has the authority to deal with those unintended consequences and deal with those. In addition, if you see institutions grow in the biennium, so that we're funded, we will be funded in August or September rather of this year, 2023, based on what we submit and the new formulas that will come forward. In 2024, we see significant growth. In addition to that growth, we see significant growth in these particular metrics the commissioner will have the authority to fund that growth. In the past, we just had to deal with that and we had to wait till the next biennium to be able to, to see any additional funding. Sorry, Dr. Sarathar, yes, just so that I understand. So these are the proposals for the legislation coming this next legislative session. So that hold harmless provision would only be one It would be in cycle? for this for the two years of the biennium. Okay, for the two years, yes, but then potentially be revisited in a couple more. So in, in, the, uh, in the 2025 session, it will no longer be in place. Okay. So beginning in the fall of 2025, if your enrollment and your production of degrees and certificates comes down significantly, your funding will come down as well. And is the idea there really because of in response to COVID-19? Yes, it's, it's, in, it's in response to COVID-19. It's to provide the institutions an opportunity to focus on what is most important and hopefully in that two-year, three-year period be able to build back up so that by 2025, it'll just flatly be based on your production of credentials of these particular metrics. So uh, the state funding for outcomes. So we are going from approximately 17% of our funding being performance-based funding to approximately 95%. So it's, it's about 94.5% of funding that would be state, that would be based on uh, outcomes-based funding. So this is 400, yes sir, Mr. From 17% to what? 94.5%. Wow. It is essentially a complete outcomes-based funding model. Rolling so, the dice, aren't you? Pardon me? Rolling the dice, aren't you? Um, we believe that it is in the right, uh, we, we believe that it, it is in the right uh, avenue for the state to fund. And we believe that we're up to producing these. We've, we've been laser focused, the, the vast majority of community colleges have been laser focused on completion and ensuring that students are earning credentials that we feel comfortable in moving forward with this. We also understood from the feedback we received from the commissioners that the legislature was not going to fund something that wasn't dramatically shifted. So the state funding for outcomes, this would be $430 million, so $215 million per year of the biennium. Um, and you're looking at these particular areas that they'll be funding. They're looking at, uh, recommendation 1.1 is looking at credentials of value, credentials of value in high demand fields, students who transfer successfully, and then students who complete a sequence of dual credit courses with a purpose, dual credit that al aligns with degrees and certificates. Are Yes, ma'am. Is there anything in there that's going to hold them to that? Because remember the success success points that, that they proposed years ago and 
EPCC was doing well with that, and then all of a sudden they pulled that rug from under us on that. Dr. Graham, you're absolutely right. So this, you're speaking to the 2017 session. In the 2017 session, the community colleges were going to recommend to the legislature that we focus on student success points um, and that the increase in funding be focused on student success points. That would have been about a million more dollars of revenue for, for El Paso Community College. Mm -hmm. We then chose to focus on um, core funding. And interestingly enough, the, the, the two presidents that were most that were most adamant about supporting core funding were, were Lone Star's CEO and um, Collin County's CEO. Um, those are the two colleges that pulled out of the Texas Association of Community Colleges. Um, you're right. At that point, the fact that we focused on core funding cost EPCC about a million dollars. This is the state. This is the plan that has been developed by the state and that our understanding is being embraced by the legislature. So this would be completely f focused on these particular areas. Recommendation, go ahead. taxpayers, why should we be funding colleges that are not producing acceptable outcomes? If we're not able to produce the, the completion rates, the academic gains, the, you know, workforce uh, <coughs> skills and all that, we shouldn't be funding them. I agree wholeheartedly, Dr. Graham, I agree, and, and again, they also provide the hold harmless for one biennium. So if institutions are not at the level of producing these particular credentials that are credentials considered to be important on outcomes-based funding, they have a biennium to get up to speed. A recommendation 1.2 is really looking at foundational levels of funding for instruction and operations um, through a state-funded guaranteed yield. This is going to be small colleges that have low tax base, tax uh, valuations. So this would be, for instance, you have community colleges, if you raised a penny of taxes in any one of the 50 community college districts, it would generate anywhere from 4000 to $40 million. And so this is the state's understanding that there's some community college districts that even if they chose to raise their taxes, it doesn't generate enough revenue. So they're looking at a, um, a leveling, if you will, of, of those particular areas. And this would be for the smaller colleges. Recommendation 1.3, again, authorizes the commissioner to create those processes to deal with unintended negative consequences by implementing this funding model in that first biennium. Affordability for students was key, and I, I will provide credit where it's due. Um, this is something that uh, Representative Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez, has been adamant about. Um, when we've asked for increases in funding, she has said not only for the institution, but for students and student aid. And so this is something that the commissioners took to heart. It would be $170 million of TEOG, the Texas Educational Opportunity Grants, that community colleges qualify for. Uh, this would be ours. The, the universities, their, their state financial aid system is Texas Grants. And what they would do is they would fund both TEOG and Texas Grants where that 70% of those eligible for, to receive those aid would receive it. Obviously, we'd love it to be 100%. It has never been 100%. But pre-pandemic, we were funded at TEOG, the 50 community colleges received 18% funding from state appropriations for that, for that aid program, while the grant, Texas grant was funded at 70%. So this would get us up to 70%. Currently, we're funded at about 28%, but that is only because enrollment fell. If enrollment was still at 750,000 students, it would be approximately 18%. So this would be a significant amount of resources for our students to be able to receive state aid. Recommendation 2.2 would be that not only would we receive this aid, but there would be financial aid for dual credit students. So El Paso Community Colleges, waive, we waive tuition by and large for the majority of our dual credit and early college high school students. So what would, we would see is we would see additional revenue based on the, the number of courses that those students are, are taking. So this again would help the college significantly. Those institutions that do charge, and there's a number of community colleges that do charge, they would have the uniform tuition. They could charge up to a certain amount that the state would cover. 
So we think that this is a win-win for the, for the student. It, level, it levels the playing field for who can take dual credit. For instance, if, you're a, if you were in Brazosport, um, they charge for their dual credit program. So those students would be able to take the same number of dual credit courses that someone at El Paso Community College would be able to take with those tuition and fees that would be waived. It doesn't punish any of the institutions. So for us, we would receive that aid. Uh, and then for those institutions that charge, if they charge up to that level of, of funding, then they would receive it as well. Recommendation 2.3 would be expanding partnerships between colleges and employers for paid work-based learning opportunities. Again, we believe that this is a win-win for everyone involved. Our students, by and large, <coughs> our students work. They don't work because they want to work. They work because they have to work. And so when they were taking on internships, those were traditionally unpaid internships. Mm -hmm. And so what we're looking at is being able to provide paid internships for our students. Recommendation three in this is, is $50 million. This is investments in community college capacity. Um, so you're looking at one-time seed grants for programs in high demand fields. This would be very much like uh, the true initiative that Dr. Smith referenced earlier. We advocated and we pushed forward that in the last legislative session. Commissioner Keller funded it through his appropriations, um, funded about $40 million in true grants, grants that we, we received several true grants individually. Colleges received grants that uh, in collaboration with other institutions, but this would again provide seed grants for programs in high demand fields to be able to stand those up in, in respective community colleges. Recommendation 3.2 would uh, support and facilitate shared services. I've explained uh, repeatedly, and the easiest one for me to explain is San Jack uh, Community College, San Jacinto Community College. Chancellor Hellier has uh, a, a significant program uh, in, in uh, maritime, and if we chose to offer that program, we have all the sand, we just don't have the water, but if we wanted to go forward and offer that program, why would we invest the millions of dollars to be able to stand that up when we could partner with Chancellor Hellier and then through this agreement, we would both receive the funding. We would receive, for instance, the, the, state, the tuition and fees, and she could receive the state appropriations. Um, so this, again, shared services will be uh, something that will be uh, encouraged, and there'll be funding to encourage that as well. And then finally, recommendation 3.3 is really looking at non-credit programs as well. Um, and it really is to help community colleges across the state to provide high quality non-credit credential programs that are convertible and stackable with credit bearing programs. So several of the programs that Dr. Smith and his team are looking at would be able to help us in these areas. Uh, the term OSAs, which are occupational uh, uh, Skills Awards, thank you. I could, Dr. Smith and I have been discussing OSA several times. Occupational Skills Awards for students that took a, for instance, two to three different courses that would provide them with a skill where they could go into the workforce and earn a living wage. Then, as they continue to earn that income, they can come back and use that as a stackable credential to go on to the level one certificate and to go on further to associate's degrees. So, in what we're looking at is $430 million. And so in my discussions with Commissioner Keller, what we're looking at is the first bill run that would come out. And right now, community college funding is in the bill, the funding bill as a whole. This is a big win for us. We don't know if it stays there, but it's currently in the base bill of funding. So there's $650 million that has been allocated to the community college sector in the base budget bill. This is a big win for us if we can make sure that it stays in the base bill. So what it would show is it would show, for instance, we received approximately, Mr. Flood is $63.5 million, if I'm not mistaken, of state appropriations. You would see the $63.5 million for El Paso Community College. Every other institution would be listed based on their, their base um, funding from the last session, then you would see the $650 million, this 430 would be allocated to the institutions based on those outcomes, based on each of the um, recommendations that I just put forward. 
those would be listed separately and then as we get into the final bill that the but that the legislature passes they would be merged but we would be able to see the difference between our initial funding the 63 and a half million and then whatever funding additional that we would receive based on the new formula runs but 430 million would be formula 170 million would go directly to students um, for aid and then finally the 50 million dollars of college capacity so we're looking at a total increase in, in funding of $650 million, $325 million per year of the biennium. A couple of things that I, I just, um, these are legislative priorities as well as defensive um, posturing that we need to be aware of. So the first four are other legislative priorities that, that the Texas Association of Community Colleges is um, going to continue to advocate for. So the Texas Educational Opportunity Grants, TEOG, which I referenced earlier, the $170 million, there's a real concern. Currently, we have to match those particular aid dollars. It has not been an issue for El Paso Community College, but for some of the smaller colleges, that match is a concern. So we're asking the state to, to do away with the match. Um, and, and we're encouraged by what we've heard so far. Cybersecurity and IT modernization is something that continues to be put forth. In the last legislative session, there was $500 million that was allocated to high speed and to uh, IT modernization. Um, but cybersecurity is going to continue to be something, and Mr. Fernandez knows way more about it than I do. But there's going to be requirements from the state. We need that those requirements be funded don't want unfunded mandates with regards to these. Clinical nursing sites, there's a lot of, there's a significant number of for-profit nursing programs that are beginning to move into the state of Texas. They then work with the hospitals and they take clinical spots that are important to colleges and universities. And so this is something that we're pushing the legislature to move forward and have, um, uh, legislation passed that these sites would be uh, allocated to the, the uh, public institutions of higher education in those specific areas. It is very difficult to find enough clinical sites uh, in particular for nursing. The Texas transfer framework continues to be moving forward. This would be um, in block transfer programs. So the state has been working on a, a number of, of transfer programs and ensuring that these courses line up and ensuring that we're able to get these to transfer. We don't see the issues in El Paso because our primary transfer partner is UTEP, but other parts of the state do significant, see significant issues with regards to uh, transfer issues. So th those are four um, priorities for the, for the community colleges. Um, last, on Tuesday of this past week, um, Bob Moore hosted a legislative preview with our delegation, um, well, with five of the six members of our delegation, Senator Blanco, uh, Representative Moody, Representative Gonzalez, Representative Ortega, and Representative Ordaz. And during the conversation, uh, we, host, we hosted it here at the Administrative Services Center. I was fortunate to be able to provide a welcome. I obviously mentioned the that I'm sure that our, our delegation would be advocating on behalf of the Texas Community College Finance Commission recommendations that had just been released in November and knew that they would focus on that. But during that conversation, uh, they talked, uh, Mr. Moore asked them several different questions, um, all hard questions, uh, and they answered them very, very uh, honestly and forthrightly. Uh, but this is one that is, is a significant concern because it will take uh, there'll be appropriations that will be allocated that really are not a state responsibility. And, and our delegation was very clear about this. But Mr. Moore asked about border security. And I only raise this because this could be possibility of, of siphoning resources away from education, both public and higher education, away from health and human services, away from responsibilities of the state. In the last 10 years, the legislature has allocated $800 million per year for border security. I remind everyone that border security is a federal government responsibility. The last legislature in the 87th legislature, they appropriated $2 billion on border security. Governor Abbott has spent approximately $8 billion on border security. So that money's coming from somewhere else within the budget. 
this next legislative session, they anticipate that there could be uh, at least $6 billion or more that would be allocated to border security. So that, to me, is a concern. Um, I will raise it in the most diplomatic way. It is a federal responsibility. Anytime that we allocate state resources to that responsibility, we're taking those state resources away from one of the other areas that the state is constitutionally mandated to fund. So I just bring it to the board's attention because I was just, I, I didn't realize, I, I realized that it was $800 million. I didn't realize that had been going on for a decade. So that's $8 billion plus the $2 billion in the last session. We're up to $10 billion. And now they're saying that up to $6 billion or more could be allocated at this legislative session. So for me, it's just something to remind our delegation and others. Our delegation obviously understands it, but to remind others, it's, it's a federal responsibility. It is not the state's responsibility. I'm happy to respond to any questions that the board may have. Do, do our delegation, does the delegation understand this presentation and the whole process that had gone through since the summer, your presentation, are they well versed on that? And do any, um, are any one of our members, are they serving on the, any of the education committees or any of the key committees that are looking at this? It's a, it's a great question. So um, what I just, um, Pam and I have just reached out to the delegation to uh, set up a dinner um, in Austin during El Paso days, Ms. Sanchez, where we can brief them, given the fact that we just wrapped up the uh, community college finance recommendations. I will reach out to them and meet with them individually, but then we, you as the board and I can meet with them in Austin as well. Um, with regards to the committee, Senator Blanco in the last session sat on the higher education committee. So I anticipate that he will continue on the education committee. Um, and I've reached out to him and told him, you know, anything that you need, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, Representative Ortega sits on the house higher education committee. So those two in particular, and then obviously Dr. Gonzalez is the vice chair, or was the vice chair of appropriations, which will be key. Uh, she was also on the subcommittee that allocated. So if the Senate committees, from my expectation, from everything that I've understood, they should remain consistent. That's the expectation. The House committees will, will likely change. Um, so I've advocated with our delegation to, uh, obviously, I would hope that Dr. Gonzalez continues as vice chair of appropriations. I am hopeful that Representative Ortega can, uh, moves forward with house higher education. Uh, we held, uh, Dr. Moe uh, coordinated a visit from Educate Texas, and Representative Ortega came and sat on a panel with us and was very focused on the Texas Community College Finance recommendation. So we're hopeful. We just don't know what committees they'll end up on. And then what, what is the strategy in terms, you, you indicated on that last slide a list of, you know, we're playing defense, right, on some of these topics, and by we, people that are, you know, here and then in higher education, but what is the strategy in terms of either submitting testimony or visiting with individuals? Is it only through the state association? Do you find it helpful if there's, um, I know there's a, a, a state organization for community college trustees, the trustees themselves. Um, what, what can we do? What is our role to do this? Obviously, we understand El Paso days. I know some individuals from the board will be attending that. I won't be attending that, but some of you all will, which is a great thing. And of course, what you are very well respected throughout the state. But is there another strategy that we can start thinking of? And, and I don't know, you know, if, if, I understand the, how this plays out, right? It's a matter of defense, but at least getting, being placed on the record or being able to have like some impact. So if we don't see any move this session, then maybe the next session. Just something that kind of just takes it, you know, just takes that step a little bit further. Do you no, have yes, ma'am. I think you're absolutely correct. And, and so we, we have several different avenues. So TAC, Tech Association of Community Colleges, we will ensure that we are on um, at the dais in testimony at the respective committees. Um, president Martinez, Ray Martinez, that is the president and CEO for TAC, is already meeting with legislators. Um, he will have a, de a debriefing with legislative staff uh, on the 19th. 
um, meeting with them in the Capitol. I'm checking with Ray to see if he needs me to come in for that because we're going to go over the commission recommendations specifically. In addition, we will line ourselves up for testimony. The trustees will play a key role uh, and we will work with the trustees as well. We'll have a joint meeting between the trustees as well as the faculty as we go forward and lay out the strategy of ensuring. Um, in addition to what I just presented, um, there, and I will make sure that well, you have those slides, but we'll get them to you electronically as well. There is also a um, set of talking points for the commission final recommendations that we will make sure that the board gets as well. Um, I would encourage um, our board to reach out to our delegation. We will, I will set those up as well. Um, but any time that you have the opportunity, whether it be in a city event or if you happen to be in Austin, we, just let us know if you're scheduled to be in Austin for the college. If you're scheduled to be in Austin for other work activities, you certainly understand. But we'll always make sure that you have all of the information that you need to be able to present and to be able to speak to delegation members. Um, we also have Community College Day, which will be January 26. Dr. Amaya and his team will be taking a group of students. Um, we will meet with them as well. It, it's not the ideal time. We would have liked to have been in February sometime, but you don't really get a lot of choice. So it's on January the 26th. We will have a, a significant, I think we have 800 individuals that have registered from the 50 community colleges all ready to go to Austin on the 26th of January to be able to present to legislators as well as staffers. The staffers are incredibly important. Legislators are the most important, but if they're not available, the staffers will work as well. So we have a concerted effort to, to move this forward and we'll continue to share that with the board um, and we'll continue to set up those meetings. Dr. Shada, yes, sir. Two, two financial questions. First yes. of all, you in, I, I forget the exact number, the pot, you said that the pot of money for community colleges is in the budget? It is okay. currently written in the base budget with uh -huh. the additional $650 million. Okay, so what you, you know, you say hopefully remain, what's, so can you put sure. some other adjectives to hopefully? <laughs> And the second one, going into it, okay, so the, at the federal level, the Republicans now have control of the House, which is their financial arm. Does that have any impact on us? I, I would, okay, so I'll, I'll start with the second one first, Mr. Rector. Um, I would anticipate that they will put forth significant resources to deal with um, the surge at the border. Um, and it'll then be their ability to work across the aisle with the Senate and get President Biden to sign off on that. Um, I do see some positive movement. I'm sure you saw uh, President Biden uh, this week, uh, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, or the day before, indicated that uh, there was going to be uh, rules and or regulations placed on the border. So I anticipate that, that, that there will be agreement that can be reached, <coughs> and they, they'll be able to appropriate those. That would help the state, because if they appropriate it, then, you know, the city, and. Uh, I know Ms. Sanchez knows at the county level, but the city and the county are, are, are funding a significant amount of resources that the federal government is responsible for. So indirectly then, now what I'm saying is if, if the financial arm of the, of the federal government is the house, does that in any impact have any kind of direct or immediately indirect impact on us financially on a community college. I can see where they fund the border Got and the border then releases other funds and it flows, but that's 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 a what if deal. The only the only thing that I'd respond to is that the five they did allocate the Congress allocated an additional five hundred dollars to Pell Grants this last um, uh, budget cycle. So that will go forward. Um, that is the only uh, budgetary item that would affect El Paso okay. Community College and our students directly. Okay. Okay, and the first question was the base bill. So right now what they do, Mr. Uxer, is that the, the House and the Senate, they, they go forward and they submit a base bill. And so this is the items that have to be funded as they go forward. Right now, community colleges are not only in the base bill, but we're in the base bill with the additional $650 million. It's a so, has to, but you don't know how much. Huh? Correct. So okay. what happens is, as they go forward, they could take community colleges out of the base bill, and then we'll be working harder on offense to push them to get it back in. If it's already in the base bill, it's a lot easier for us. We just have to play defense during the session rather than offense. Any Ms. other questions? Mrs. Robles. Ms. Robles. 
Uh, I just want to bring up uh, a fact. When we attended the Texas Association of Community College in Austin, uh, it was recommended that each board appoint a representative from the board to be the contact person so that there would be that communication to prioritize what the community colleges of Texas would would bring up to the state legislature. And um, I know it, it was, I believe it was discussed on the board and somebody was appointed. I don't recall, my um, memory has gone on vacation temporarily. Yes. No worries, Mrs. Robles. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Ms. Nahira was, was uh, appointed by the board. Yes, we were thinking that it was Bonnie. But anyway, I think uh, it is something that we should touch base so that we will be in sync, hopefully, we can come together and, uh, and believe me, um, trustees have quite a bit of influence because we're elected. Absolutely. We have a constituency, so I think we should use that and uh, perhaps we should start getting together to prioritize what we want to bring up. Yes, ma'am, you're absolutely correct. And, and we, we became, uh, the presidents and chancellors across the state community colleges uh, became a bit wiser a number of years ago when we realized that trustees are elected officials and other elected officials listen to uh, elected officials more, more forthrightly than they do to presidents and chancellors. So we will make sure that our trustees are involved, just like we're making sure that our students are involved as well. Um, those are key constituents and, and we will take advantage of those, work with our board and see who's available at certain times. Uh, and there'll be a number of, of um, opportunities to go to Austin and to be uh, in front of the legislature. So yes, ma'am, absolutely. Dr. Serata, if I may? Yes, Ms. Naira, the voice of God. <laughs> Please, Sorry, guys. you sound much better. Uh, well, kinda. Uh, so, with with CAT with the CAT board, I mean, if if you guys can make it to some of the legislative committee meetings, and and I can make sure that everybody gets that that email whenever the legislative committee meet, uh, is is meeting. It's a lot of great information to have, and that way, if we ever go to and El Paso days, if anybody can go, it's a really great opportunity to be in front of the legislature and, and talk in front of in, in front of all. Um, our people here from El Paso and talk to them about what we need. I know, like Dr. Serata said, ideally, you know, it's not a lot of time, but it is a great opportunity for us to voice our concerns. And getting information from you, Dr. Serata, would be really nice to have beforehand of, of what you all want us to talk about, as, as well as uh, the CAP board is supposed to send. Um, I'm going to see if they can get us some information as well as key talking points of things that are important um, for the community colleges when we go do that. No, Ms. Nahara, absolutely. And, and so it's our responsibility at TAC. Um, so the, the Community College Association of Texas Trustees um, is a subsidiary of TAC. So all of the information that I have, Ms. Scott has as well. And so we will ensure that I provide all of these, um, this presentation, as well as the talking points and all of the, uh, all of the pieces that come forward from TAC and that continues to be produced. We'll make sure that we have those for you. In addition, um, when, and, when and if you're in Austin, um, uh, Ray Martinez and his team know, and we discussed this at our legislative committee meeting uh, last week, that we will have hard copies available at the TAC offices so that you, anyone can go by, pick these up, and as you go on to your meetings at the Capitol. Um, it is incredibly important, and you're right with regards to El Paso days. I've looked at the agenda. The agenda is, is not as... Um, it's not as relevant for, for El Paso Community College. It's, it's incredibly important for our community, um, but it, we can veer away from that agenda and set up the meetings that we need to set up while we're in Austin with those players that are relevant to the Community College Finance Commission. Perfect, thank you so much. Any other comments, concerns? No. Thank you, Dr. Serrata. Thank you, Dr. That's very good information. Thank you. And I think with that, we have already had our executive session, um, and we will continue uh, with our monthly reports so that we can craft and monitor our strategic direction. 
Um, the next meeting for the college will be uh, on the 23rd of January at 2 p.m. for the president's evaluation, and the regular meeting will start at 4.30. Anything else? If not, we are ready to adjourn. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for Thank being you. here. Thank you for being staff on a Saturday.